creepypastas go as far back as the 1990s and originally began as chain mail. You know, the classic forward this to 10 people or something bad will happen type of stuff. Though they started taking off when the internet became more mainstream with the term even coming from copy pasta. Get it? Copy, pasta, copy, and paste. Being born in 2002, I and many of my middle school friends were fascinated over the scary concepts of the Slender Man, Jeff the Killer, Smile Dog, and so much more. So I thought it would be a nice idea to compile every single original creepypasta story and read them all to you guys. Even though I knew of creepypastas, I never went out of my way to actually read them. So I hope you guys use this as a guide and come back to this video whenever you're in the mood to hear a creepypasta. And side note, creepypastas are fake. They are not real. No, Slender Man is not gonna kidnap you at some point in your life. The way this video is gonna work is I'm I'm going to read each original story and then provide some extra origin info after. I want to give full credit to creepypasta.com as that's where I directly read from, and all the other credits such as music and art will also be linked in the description. If I missed any credits, please let me know down below. I'll be popping in between stories to give my takes and make you feel a little bit less lonely. And the last thing I have to say is that Stop Loving Me CDs and cassettes are out now, and there's a few left. I don't know by the time this video if they're still going to be up, but they're at EarlDoesn'tExist.com, so you can go check them out over there. If my eye looks weird, that's because I currently have an eye infection. This is how bad my face looked during these past few days. So, uh, it's calming down now. Uh, I feel better. Thanks for asking. <laughs> are you guys ready for my longest video ever? Let's get started with the video. Abandoned by Disney, original author, Slime Beast. Some of you may have heard that the Disney Corporation is responsible for at least one real, quote-unquote, live ghost town. Disney built the Treasure Island Resort in Bakers Bay in the Bahamas. It didn't start as a ghost town. Disney's cruise ships would actually stop at the resort and leave tourists there to relax in luxury. This is a fact. Look it up. Disney blew 30 mil in that place. Yes, 30 million dollars. Then, they abandoned it. Disney blamed the shallow waters, too shallow for their ships to safely operate, and there was even blame cast on the work saying that since they were from the Bahamas, they were too lazy to work a regular schedule. That's where the factual nature of the story ends. It wasn't because of sand, and it obviously wasn't because foreigners are lazy. Both are convenient excuses. I sincerely doubt those reasons were legitimate. Why don't I buy the official story? Because of Mowgli's Palace. Near the beachside city of Emerald Isle in North Carolina, Disney began construction of Mowgli's Palace in the late 1990s. The concept was a jungle-themed resort with a large, you guessed it, palace in the center of the whole thing. If you're unfamiliar with the character of Mowgli, then you might better remember the story, The Jungle Book. If you haven't seen it anywhere else, you know it as a Disney cartoon from decades past. Mowgli is an abandoned child in the jungle, essentially raised by animals and simultaneously threatened and pursued by other animals. Mowgli's palace was a controversial undertaking from the start. Disney bought up a ton of high-priced land for the project. There was actually a scandal surrounding some of the purchases. The local government claimed, quote, eminent domain on people's homes, then turned around and sold the properties to Disney. At one point, a home that had just been constructed was immediately condemned with little to no explanation. The land grabbed by the government was supposedly for some fictional highway project. Knowing full well what was going on, people started calling it Mickey Mouse Highway. Then there was the concept art. A group of stuffed shirts from Disney Co. actually held a city meeting. They intended to sell everyone on how lucrative this project was going to be for everyone. When they showed the concept art, this gigantic Indian palace surrounded by jungle, staffed with men and women in loincloths and travel gear, well, suffice to say everyone flipped their shit. We're talking about a large Indian palace, jungle, and loincloths, not only in the center of a relatively wealthy area, but also a somewhat xenophobic area of the southern USA. It was a questionable mix at that point in history. One member of the crowd tried to storm the stage, but he was quickly subdued by security after he managed to break one of the presentation boards over his knee. Disney took that community and essentially broke it over its knee as well. The houses were raised, the land was cleared, and there wasn't a damn thing anyone could do or say about it. Local TV and newspapers were against the resort at the beginning, but some insane connection between Disney's media holdings and the local venues came into play and their opinions turned on a dime. So anyway, Treasure Island, the Bahamas. Disney sunk those millions in and then split. The same thing happened with Mowgli's Palace. Construction was complete. Visitors actually stayed at the resort. Surrounding communities were flooded with traffic and the usual annoyances associated with an influx of lost and irritated tourists. Then, it all stopped. Disney shut it down and nobody knew what the hell to think. But they were pretty happy about it. Disney's loss was pretty hilarious and wonderful to a large group of folks who didn't want this in the first place. I honestly didn't give this place another thought since hearing it close over a decade ago. I live maybe four hours from Emerald Isle, so really I only heard the rumblings and didn't experience any of it firsthand. Then, I read this article from someone who had explored the Treasure Island resort and posted a whole blog about all the crazy shit he found in there. Stuff just left behind. Things smashed, defaced, probably ruined by the disgruntled former employees who had just lost their jobs. Hell, the locals from all around probably had a hand in wrecking that place. People there felt just as angry about Treasure Island as folks here about Mowgli's Palace. Plus, there were rumors that Disney had released their aquarium stock into the local waters when they closed, including sharks. Who wouldn't want to take a few swings at some merchandise after that? Well, what I'm getting at is this blog about 
Treasure Island got me thinking. Even though many years had passed since its closing, I figured it might be cool to do some urban exploration at Mowgli's Palace, take some photos, write about my experience, and probably see if there was anything I could take home as a memento. I'm not gonna say I wasted no time in getting there, because honestly it took me another year after I first found that Treasure Island article to get around to going up to Emerald Isle. Over the course of that year, I did a lot of research on the palace resort, or rather, I tried to. Naturally, no official Disney site or resource made any mention of the place that had been scrubbed clean. Even more odd, however, was that nobody before myself had apparently thought to blog about the place or even post a photo. None of the local TV or newspaper sites had one word about the place, though that was to be expected since they had all swung Disney's way. They wouldn't be out there lauding their embarrassment, you know? Recently, I learned that corporations can actually ask Google, for example, to remove links from search results, basically for no good reason. Looking back, it's probably not that nobody spoke about the resort, but rather their words were made inaccessible. So in the end, I could barely find the place. All I had to do was go on an old as hell map I'd received in the mail back in the 90s. It was a promotional item sent out to people who had recently been to Disney World, and I guess since I had been there in the late 80s, that was recent. I didn't really intend to hang on to it. It just got shoved in with my books and comics from my childhood. I'd only remembered it months into my research, and even then it took me another few weeks to locate the storage bin my parents had shoved it all into. But I did find it. Locals were no help, as most were transplants who moved to the beach in recent years, or old residents who just sneered at me and made rude gestures the second I managed to say, where would I find Mowgli's? Yeah. The drive took me through an inordinately long corridor of overgrowth. Tropical plants that had run rampant and overpopulated the area mixed with the native species of flora that actually belonged there and had tried to reclaim the land. I was in awe when I reached the front gates of the resort. Tremendous, monolithic wooden gates whose supports to either side looked like they must have been cut from giant sequoias. The gate itself had been gauged in several places by woodpeckers and eaten away at the base by burrowing insects. Hanging on the gate was a sheet of metal, some random scrap, with hand-painted letters scrawled in black, abandoned by Disney, clearly the handiwork of some past local or employee who wanted to make some small protests. The gates were open enough to walk through, but not drive, so grabbing my digital camera and the map, whose flip side showed a layout of the resort, I set off on foot. The inner grounds of the place were just as overgrown as the entryway. Palm trees stood unattended and ragged among piles of their own coconuts. Banana plants similarly stood in their own stinking, bug-riddled refuse. There was this sort of clash between order and chaos, as carefully planted rows of perennial flowers mixed with obnoxious tall weeds and stinking, blank and mushrooms, all that remained of any outdoor structures were broken, rotting wood in various charred bits of unidentifiable material. What was most likely an information booth or an outdoor bar was now simply a pile of assorted debris chopped up by past vandalism and ravaged by weather. The most interesting thing on the grounds was a statue of Baloo, the friendly bear from the Jungle Book, which stood in a sort of courtyard in front of the main building. He was frozen in the pose of making a wave toward no one, staring into empty space with a silly, toothy grin as bird shit covered whole swaths of his fur and vines and swore his platform. Form. I approached the main building, the palace, only to find the outside of the building covered in graffiti, where the original paint hadn't peeled and chipped away. The front doors weren't just open, they had been taken off their hinges and were stolen. Above the front doors, or the gaping maw where they had been, someone had once again painted Abandoned by Disney. Wish I could tell you about all the awesome stuff I saw in the palace. Forgotten statues, abandoned cash registers, a full-fledged secret society of homeless bums, but no. The inside of the building was so stark, so bare, that I actually think people had stolen the molding off the walls. Anything that was too big to steal, counter desks, fake giant trees, they were all resting amid this empty echo chamber that amplified my every step like a slow rat-a-tat of a machine gun. I checked the floor plan and headed to all the locations that might seem in any way interesting. The kitchen was, as you'd imagine, an industrial food prep area with all the appliances and space. No expenses spared. Every glass surface was broken, every door knocked off its hinges, every metal surface kicked and dented, the entire place smelled like very old piss. The huge freezer, not even remotely cool now, had a row upon row of empty shelf space, hooks hung from the ceiling, probably for hanging cuts of meat, and as I stood inside for a moment, I noticed they were swinging. Each hook swung in a random direction, but their movements were slow and small that it was almost impossible to see. I figured it had been caused by my footsteps, so I stopped one from swinging by clutching it in my fist and carefully letting go, but within seconds it started to swing once more. The bathrooms were in much the same state as the rest of the place, just like the Treasure Island Resort. Someone had methodically smashed each porcelain commod with coconuts and other implements. There was about a half inch of rancid, stinking, stagnant water on the floor, so I I didn't stay there very long. What's odd is that the toilets and sinks, and the bidets in the ladies room, yes I went there, all dripped leaked, or just ran freely. It seemed to me that they should have shut the water off long, long ago. There were plenty of rooms in the resort, but naturally I didn't have time to look through them all. The few I did peer into were similarly wrecked, and I didn't expect to find anything there. I thought there was actually a television or radio in one room, because I really think I heard a quiet conversation coming out. Though it was like a whisper, probably my own breathing echoing in the silence, or just another case of the sound of flowing water playing tricks on the mind. This is what it sounded like. 
I know, I know, that sounds ridiculous. I'm just telling you what I experienced, why I thought there might have been something running in that room, or worse, some vagrants who had holed up there and probably would have knifed me. At the front doors of the palace again, I figured I hadn't found anything of note and had wasted the trip up. As I looked out the door, I noticed something interesting in the courtyard that I had apparently missed. Something that would give me at least one thing to show for all of my trouble. Even if it was just a photograph, there was a lifelike statue of a python, maybe 80 feet long, coiled up and sunning itself on a pedestal right in the center of the area. It was almost time for the sun to start setting, so the light fell into the object in the perfect way for a photograph. I approached the python and snapped the photo. Then I stood on my toes and snapped another. I moved closer again to get the details of its face. Slowly, casually, the python lifted its head, looked directly into my eyes, turned, and slithered off the pedestal, across the grass and into the trees. All 80 feet of it, its head long disappeared into the woods before its tail even left the sunny spot. Disney had released all their exotic animals onto the grounds. Right there on my floor plan map was the, quote, reptile house. I should have known. I had read about the sharks at Treasure Isle, and I should have known they'd done this. I was dumbfounded, just utterly stupefied. My mouth must have been hanging open for the longest time before I came back down to earth and snapped it shut. I blinked a few times and snapped away from where the snake had been, back toward the palace. Even though it was totally gone, I still wasn't taking any chances and backed my way into the building. I took a few deep breaths and slaps to my own face to get myself right in the head again. I looked for a place to sit down, as my legs were feeling a bit like jelly at this point. Of course, there was no place to sit down unless I wanted to recline in the broken glass and dead leaf carpet or haul myself up onto a desk of questionable reliability. I had seen some stairs in the palace's lobby and decided to go and have a seat there until I felt better. The staircase was far enough from the front of the building to be relatively clean. I pulled the wedge of metal off the wall, once again painted with the abandoned by Disney motto. I placed the wedge on the stairs and sat on it to keep it somewhat clean. The stairway led downward, below ground level. Using my camera flash as a sort of improvised flashlight, I could see that the staircase ended in a metal mesh door with a padlock. A sign on the door, a real sign, read, mascots only, thank you. This perked up my spirits a little bit, for two reasons. One, a mascots only area would have definitely had some interesting stuff back in the day. Two, the padlock was still in place. Nobody had gone down there. Not the vandals, not the looters, nobody. This was the only place I could actually explore and perhaps find something interesting to photograph or want only steal. I had come to the palace essentially agreeing with myself that it was okay to take anything I wanted because hey, abandoned. Didn't take much to bust the lock. Well, actually that's wrong. It didn't take much to bust the metal plate on the wall that had the padlock it was hooked up to. Time and decay had done most of the work for me and I was able to bend the metal plate enough to pull the screws out of the wall. Something nobody else had apparently thought of or hadn't been able to do at the time. The mascots only area was a start and very welcome change from the rest of the building I'd seen. For one, every second or third fluorescent light overhead was illuminated, even though they flickered and faded randomly. Also, nothing had been stolen or broken, even if age and exposure were defiantly taking their toll. Tables had notepads and pens. There were clocks, even a punch-in clock on the wall complete with filled out time cards. Chairs were scattered around and there was even a small break room with an old static-filled television and long rotted out food and drink on the counters. It was like one of those post-apocalyptic movies where everything is left in the state of evacuation. As I walked in the maze-like sub-basement hallways of the mascots only area, the sights just became more and more interesting. As I went further, desks and tables were knocked over, paper scattered and almost melded with a damp floor, and a large carpet of mold was slowly overtaking the real rotting crimson floor covering. Everything was sort of squishy. Anything wood disintegrated into mush when I applied even the least amount of force, and clothing items hanging on hooks in one of the rooms simply fell to moist threads if I tried to unhook them. One thing that annoyed me was that the light was becoming more sparse and unreliable as I went further into the dark. Eventually, I reached a black and yellow striped door with the words Character Prep 1 stenciled on it. The door wouldn't open at first. I figured this was probably where the costumes were kept, and I defiantly wanted a photograph of that twisted, sneaking mess. Try as I might, whatever angle or trick I tried, the door wouldn't budge. That is, until I gave up and started to walk away. That was when there was a slight popping sound, and the door creaked open slowly. Inside, the room was completely dark, pitch black. I used the camera flash to look for a light switch in the wall, but there was nothing. As I made my search, I I was jarred out of my sense of excitement by a large electrical buzz. Rows of lights overhead suddenly flashed to life, flickering and fading in and out like the rest I had passed. It took a second for my eyes to adjust, and it seemed like the light was gonna keep getting brighter and brighter until the bulbs exploded, but just when I thought they would reach that critical stage, the lights dimmed a bit and steady. The room was exactly as I had pictured it. Various Disney costumes hung on the walls, fully put together, like strange cartoon cadavers hung from invisible nooses. There was an entire rack of loincloths and native clothes on hangers toward the 
back. What I found odd, and what I wanted to photograph right away, was a Mickey Mouse costume at the center of the room. Unlike the other costumes, it was lying on its back in the center of the floor like a murder victim. The fur on the costume was rotten and shedding, creating bare patches. What was even more odd, however, was the coloring of the costume. It was like a photo negative of the actual Mickey Mouse. Black where he should have been white, and white where he should have been black. His normally red overalls were light blue. The sight was off-putting enough that I actually put off photographing the thing until last. I took a picture of the hanging costumes on the walls. Upward angles, downward angles, side shots to show an entire row of frozen, putrid cartoon faces, some with plastic eyes missing. Then I decided to stage a shot, just one of the bedraggled characters' heads on the slick, grimy floor. I reached for the headpiece of a Donald Duck costume and carefully removed it so that the thing wouldn't fall apart in my hands. As I looked into the face of the wide-eyed, moldering head, a loud clattering sound made me jump with a fright. I looked down at my feet, and there between my shoes was a human skull. It had fallen out of the mascot head and shattered into pieces on my feet. Only the empty face and lower jaw remained, staring up at me. I dropped the duck head immediately, as you'd expect, and moved for the door. As I stood in the doorway, I looked back to the skull on the floor. I had taken a picture of it, you know? I had to. For any number of reasons that may seem silly, but only if you don't think it through. I need proof of what happened, especially if Disney was going to somehow make this go away. I had no doubt in my mind, right from the start, that even if it was gross negligence, Disney was responsible for this. That's when Mickey, the photo negative opposite Mickey in the middle of the floor, started to get up. First sitting up, then climbing to its feet. The Mickey Mouse costume, or whoever was inside it, stood there at the center of the room, its fake face just staring directly at me as I mumbled, no, over and over and over. With shaking hands, a violently thrashing heart, and legs that once again turned to jelly, I managed to lift the camera and aim it at the opposite creature, now quietly sizing me up. The digital camera screen displayed only dead pixels in the shape of the thing. It was a perfect silhouette of the Mickey Mouse costume. As the camera moved in my unsteady hands, the dead pixels spread, mirroring the screen wherever Mickey's outline moved to. Then, the camera died, went blank and quiet and broken. I raised my eyes once again to the Mickey Mouse costume. Hey. It said in a hushed, perverted, but perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice, Wanna see my head come off? It started to pull at its own head, working its clumsy, glove-clad fingers around its neck with clawing and patient movement, similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free from a predator's jaws. As it worked its digits into its neck, so much blood, so much thick, chunky, yellow blood. I turned away as I heard a sickening tearing of cloth and flesh, only cared about getting away. Above the doorway out of this room, I saw the final message clawed into the metal with bone or fingernails, abandoned by God. I never got the pictures out of the camera, I never wrote the blog entry about it. After I ran from that place, fled for sanity if not my very life, I knew why Disney didn't want anyone to know about this place. They didn't want anyone like me getting in. They didn't want anything like that getting out. Abandoned by Disney. I really like this one. I really liked reading this one. It was the most like convincing that it could be realistic. It was the most convincing that it could be a real thing. But no, obviously this didn't happen. I feel like it was so realistic up until like the corny yellow blood at the bottom. Like the negative Mickey. I feel like that's when it got corny. I'm not saying it's bad. It's a bad story, you know. Like back in the day, back in our day, we didn't have ARGs. We had creepypastas. I'm not going to give these a rating. I'm just going to let y'all know. Slight takes of them. I think it was a cool story. A little corny at the end. Let's head on to Lavender Town now. Lavender Town Syndrome. The Lavender Town Syndrome, also known as Lavender Town Tone or Lavender Town Suicides, was a peak in suicides and illness of children between the ages of 7 to 12. Shortly after the release of Pokemon Red and Green in Japan, back in February 27, 1996, rumors say that the suicides and illness only occurred after the children had played the game and reached Lavender Town, whose theme music had extremely high frequencies. That study showed that only teens and young children can hear since their ears are more sensitive. Due to Lavender Town, at least 200 children supposedly committed suicide, and many more developed illnesses and inflictions. The children who committed suicide usually did so by hanging or jumping from heights. Those who did not act irrationally complained of severe headaches after listening to Lavender Town's theme. Although Lavender Town now sounds differently depending on the game, this mass hysteria was caused by the first Pokemon game release. After the Lavender Town incident, programmers had fixed Lavender Town's theme music to be at a lower frequency, and since the children were no longer affected by it, one video appeared in 2010 using special software to analyze the audio of Lavender Town's music. When played, the software created images of the you now near the end of the audio. This raised a controversy since the Yunnan didn't appear until the Generation 2 game, Silver, Gold, and Crystal. The Yunnan translates to Leave Now. There's also said to be a beta version of Lavender Town. It said that the beta version of Pocket Monsters was released to some kids to test the games. Ah, we see each other once more. I know this one was like, this is the shortest one. The Lavender Town was the shortest one. 
Why am I wearing shades? You already know. I showed you my eye. I hear it is again. <laughs> there you go. But Lavender Town, I actually used to believe this one when I was a kid. I can say that about a lot of these, but I used to believe the Lavender Town one, and uh, obviously this is fake. This is not real. There is no denying that the Lavender Town song is genuinely pretty creepy. It's a pretty creepy song. Yeah, there's nothing more to say about Lavender Town Syndrome, so let's head on over to Sonic.exe. Sonic.exe. I'm a total Sonic the Hedgehog fan, much like everyone else. I like the newer games, but I don't mind playing the classics. I don't think I've ever played glitchy or hacked games before, though I don't think I want to play any after the experience I had. It started on a nice summer afternoon. I was playing Sonic Unleashed. I liked how you get to explore towns in it, until I noticed, out of my peripheral vision, that the mailman had arrived and put something in my mailbox as usual and left. Paused my game to see what I got in the mail. The only thing in the mailbox was a CD case for computers and a note. I took it inside. I looked at the note first and realized it was from my dear friend. And Kyle, let's just call him that, whom I hadn't heard from in two weeks. I know that because I recognize his handwriting, though it was weird how it looked. It looked badly written and scratchy and somewhat difficult to read, as if Kyle was having a hard time writing it down and did it in a hurry. This is what he wrote, Tom, I can't take it anymore. I had to get rid of this thing somehow before it was too late, and I was hoping you'd do it for me. I can't do it. He's after me. And if you don't destroy this CD, he'll come after you too. He's too fast for me. Please, Tom, destroy this godforsaken disc before he comes after you too. It's too late for me. Destroy the disc and you'll destroy him, but do it quick, otherwise Otherwise, he'll catch you. Don't even play the game. It's what he wants. Just destroy it. Please, Kyle. Well, that was certainly weird. Even though Kyle is my best friend and I haven't seen him in two weeks, I didn't do what he asked me. I didn't think that a simple gaming disc would do anything bad to him. After all, it's just a game, right? Boy, was I wrong about that. Anyway, I looked at the disc and it looks like any ordinary computer CDR disc, except it had black marker on it written Sonic.exe, and it was much unlike Kyle's handwriting, meaning that he must have gotten it from someone else, like a pawn shop or eBay. When I saw Sonic on the writing of the CD, I was actually excited and wanted to play it since I'm a big Sonic fan. I went up to my room and turned on my computer and put the disc in and installed the game. When the little screen popped up, I noticed that it was the first Sonic game. I was like, awesome, because like I said earlier, I like the classics. The first thing I noticed that was out of place was when I pressed start. There was a split second when I saw the title image turn into something much different, something that I now consider horrifying before cutting to black. I remember what the image looked like in that split second before the game cut to black. The sky had darkened. The title emblem was rusted and ruined. The Sega 1991 was now instead Sega 666. The water had turned red, like blood, except it looked hyper-realistic. But the freakiest thing was that in that split second, Sonic's eyes were pitch black and bleeding, with two glowing red dots staring right at me, and his smile had stretched wider, up to the edge of his face. I was rather disturbed about the image when I saw it, though I figured it was just a glitch and forgot about it. After it cut to black, it stayed like that for about 10 seconds or so, and then another weird thing happened. The save file select from Sonic the Hedgehog 3 popped up, and I was like, what the fuck? What's this doing in the first Sonic game? Anyway, then I noticed something off. The background was the dark cloudy sky of the Bad Stardust Speedway level from Sonic CD, and there were only three save files. The music was that creepy caverns of winter music from Earthbound, only it was extended and seemed to have been in reverse. And the image for the save file where you see a preview of the level you're on is just red static for all three files. What freaked me out was the character select. It showed only Tails, Knuckles, and to my surprise, Dr. Robotnik. Now, I was sure that something was up. I mean, how could you play as Robotnik in a classic Sonic game? That's when I realized this wasn't a glitchy game, it was a hacked game. Yeah, it definitely looked hacked, it was really creepy, but as a smart gamer, I wasn't scared, or at least tried not to be. I told myself that it was just a hacked game and there was nothing wrong with that. Anyway, shaking off the creeped out feeling, I picked file 1 and chose Tails and got started. The game froze for about 5 seconds and I heard a creepy pixelated laugh that sounded an awful lot like that Kefka guy from Final Fantasy before cutting to black. The screen stayed black for about 10 seconds or more, then it showed the typical level title thing, except the simplistic shapes were different shades of red, and the text showed only Hill, Act 1. The screen faded in, and the level title vanished, revealing Tails in the Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1. The music was different though, it sounded like a peaceful melody in reverse. Anyway, I started playing, and had Tails running like you would in any of the classic Sonic games. What was odd was that as Tails was running along the level, there was nothing but flat ground and a few trees for 5 minutes. That was when the peaceful music started to lower down into slow deep tones very slowly as I kept going. I suddenly saw something and I stopped to see what it was. It was one of the small animals lying dead on the ground, bleeding. That was when the music started to slow down. Tails had a shocked and saddened look on his face that I never saw him have before, so I had to move along. And he kept that worried look on his face. As he kept moving, I saw more dead animals as Tails moved past them, looking more and more worried as the music lowers and he moves past more dead animals. I was shocked to see how they all died. They looked like somebody killed them in rather gruesome ways. The squirrel was hung on a tree with what appeared to be his intestines hanging out. A bunny had all four of his limbs torn off, and a duck had his 
eyes gouged out and his throat slit. I felt sick to my stomach when I saw this massacre and apparently so did Tails. After a few seconds, there were no more animals and the music seemed to have stopped. I still kept Tails to continue. After a minute passed after the music stopped, Tails was running up a hill and then stopped. It wasn't until I saw why. Sonic was there on the other side of the screen with his back against Tails with his eyes closed. Tails looked happy to see Sonic when his smile faltered, obviously noticing that Sonic wasn't responding to him, if not acting as if he was totally oblivious of Tails' presence. Tails walked slowly towards Sonic, and I noticed that I wasn't even moving my keyboard to make a move, so this had to be a cutscene. Suddenly, I began to have a growing feel of dread as Tails walked closer to Sonic to get his attention. I felt that Tails was in danger and something bad was gonna happen. I heard faint static growing louder as Tails was but inches away from Sonic and stopped and stuck his hand out to touch him. That foreboarding feeling in my gut was growing stronger, and I felt the urge to tell Tails to get away from Sonic as the static grew louder. Suddenly, in a split second, I saw Sonic's eyes open, and they were black with those red glowing dots, just like that title image, though there wasn't a smile. When that happened, the screen turned black and the static sound was off. It stayed black for about 7 seconds, and then white text appeared, forming a message saying, Hello, do you want to play with me? At this point, I was creeped out. I didn't even want to continue the game, but my curiosity got the best of me when I was taken to a different level, with the level title now saying, Hide and Seek. This time I was in the Angel Island level from Sonic 3, and it looked like everything was on fire. Tails looked as though he was scared out of his wits this time. He actually looked at me and made frantic gestures to me, as if he wanted to get out of the area as fast as possible. I was starting to get freaked out by this. I mean, Tails was actually breaking the fourth wall, trying to tell me to get him out of there. So I pressed down on the arrow key as hard as I could to make him run. A pixelated version of that creepy theme when you meet Shadow at the Ark as Robotnik from SA2 from Sonic Adventure 2 was playing as I made Tails trek through the desolate forest. Suddenly, I heard that creepy laugh again. That awful Kefka laugh right after 10 seconds had passed as I helped Tails run through the forest. And then I started seeing flashes of Sonic popping up everywhere on the screen, again with those black and red eyes. The music changed to that suspenseful drowning jingle as I see Sonic behind Tails slowly gaining up on him flying. Sonic wasn't running, he was actually flying. The flying pose his sprite was making looked very similar to Metal Sonic's flying pose in Sonic CD, except it was just Sonic, and he had those black and red eyes again. Only this time, he had the most deranged looking grin on his face. He looked as though he was enjoying the torment he was giving the poor little fox as he gained up on him. Suddenly when Tails tripped, another cutscene, the music stopped and Sonic vanished. Tails laid there and started crying for 15 seconds. The scene was rather upsetting to watch and I kind of teared up myself, but then Sonic appeared right in front of Tails and Tails looked up in horror. Blood started coming down those blackened eyes of Sonic's as a grin slowly grew on his face as he looked down at the horrified fox. I could do nothing but watch. Just in a split second, Sonic lunged at Tails right before the screen went black. There was a loud screeching noise that only lasted five seconds. The text returned, only this time it said, you're too slow, wanna try again? And then that god awful laugh came in. I was so shocked by what happened. Did Sonic murder Tails? No, he, he couldn't have. He and Tails are supposed to be best friends, right? Why did Sonic do that to him? I shook the shock off as I was brought back into the character select screen. The save file that had Tails was different though. Tails was no longer in the box itself, but in the TV screen itself, which was flickering with that red static. Tails' expression scared me. His eyes were black and bleeding. His orange fur had gone black, and he had an expression of anguish on his face. Trying to ignore it, I picked Knuckles next. The laugh came in again, and the screen cuts to black again, and stayed there for another 10 seconds. This time, the level said, you can't run. I was really freaked out by now. I couldn't really tell if this was a glitch, or a hack, or some kind of sick twisted joke, or anything really. But despite my fear of what happened next, I kept playing. The next level looked so much different. It had the ground of the scrap brain zone, but the sky background looked like the main menu. It had the dark, reddish, cloudy sky, but it was the music that creeped me out the most. It sounded like Gygus' theme right after you beat Pokey in Earthbound. I also noticed how Knuckles looked just as afraid as Tails did, though not as much. More rather a little unnerved. He broke the fourth wall just like Tails, and it looked like he wasn't sure about going on, but I made a move anyway. He ran down the straight pathway in this dark level, and as he did, the screen started to flicker red static a couple times, and then that maddening laugh came in again. Then, after a few seconds of running, I noticed several blood stains on the metallic ground. I felt a growing sense of fear again, thinking something horrible was gonna happen to Knuckles. He looked nauseated walking down this blood stained road, but I kept him going. Suddenly, as Knuckles ran, Sonic appeared right in front of him with those black and red eyes, and then red static appeared again. Then the static vanished, showing nothing but black screen with text saying, Found you. Now I was scared. Sonic found Knuckles already? What was going on? Anyway, red static came again, and then I was back to the level. Knuckles looked like he was panicking, and Sonic was nowhere to be found. And this time, that high-pitched squealing from Silent Hill 1's final boss was playing. Was this some kind of boss battle with Sonic? I hope to god it wasn't, honestly. Suddenly, Sonic appeared right behind Knuckles in what appeared to be pixelated black smoke. I made Knuckles turn and then punch Sonic, but Sonic vanished in black pixelated smoke before I could even land a hit. That terrible laugh went off again. Then Sonic 
Sonic appeared behind Knuckles again, and then I made him punch again, and Sonic vanished again laughing. Knuckles was panicking even more, and even I felt like I was going crazy. Sonic was practically playing with us. He was playing a sick, twisted little mind game with me and Knuckles. Another cutscene played as Knuckles fell to his knees and clutched his head, sobbing. I felt his agony. Sonic was driving both of us crazy. And then, in a split second, Sonic lunged at Knuckles, and the screen went black with another distorted screeching noise that lasted for at least three seconds. Another text message appeared. So many souls to play with. So little time. Would you agree? What the hell? Just what's going on? I started to think Sonic was actually trying to talk to me through the game, but I was too scared to think that. I was brought back by the main menu, and this time, the second file box had Knuckles in the TV screen. His red fur had darkened to a reddish gray, his dreadlocks were dripping with blood, and his eyes were black and bleeding too, and he had a look of sadness on his face. I began to think that those are the actual characters trapped in those TV screens on the save files, but I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it, so I shut the game off and took a break. I took a nap, wish I hadn't, because I then began to have the most disturbing nightmare. I was in pitch black darkness, though I was under the light given off by a lamp hung high above my head. I could hear the cries of Knuckles and Tails nearby. They were saying stuff like, help us, and why did you give us to him, and run away before he gets you too. Their cries died out as I then heard Sonic laugh. His laugh. It sounded a lot like the distorted Kefka laugh. You're a lot of fun to play with, kid. Just like your friend Kyle, though he didn't last long. I was scared and looking around for the source of the voice. Won't be long now until you join him and all my other friends. I saw him walking towards me, flickering in and out in several directions. You can't run, kid. You're in my world now, just like the others. When he grabbed me and I saw his bleeding black and red eyes, along with that grin, I woke up with a fright. After a couple of hours, I decided to continue playing the game. I don't know why, but I had to figure out why this was happening, so I turned on the computer, turned on the game, and selected Robotnik next. I still thought that was wacky, playing as Robotnik, but anyway, the level title appeared again, and this time it said dot dot dot, which I found really freaky. This time, I was in some kind of hallway. It didn't really look like it was from any of the classic Sonic games, though it had that pixelated style. The floor was shiny and checkered, the walls were dark and grayish purple, with animated candlelights, and a few dark blood stains here and there. There was a dark red curtain hanging above the top part of the screen. Every 12 seconds or so, that red curtain sways very slowly, but whenever you're playing the game, you can barely see it move. The music was oddly pleasant, a piano playing a rather sad yet peaceful song, but I knew better. This was the song that played in Hill Act 1, only it wasn't in reverse. Robotnik didn't look entirely nervous like Tails and Knuckles did, but he had a suspicious look on his face, as if he was a bit paranoid. He did a little animation when I just left him standing, he turns his head to the left and then to the right at least twice and then shrugs at me, as if he has no idea where he was or what was going on. Even though I was scared out of my mind about what was going to happen, I had Robotnik continue onward. He did his usual running animation. You know, when you've beaten him at the end of a classic Sonic game and then you chase him as we continued going through the hallway. Then I stopped to look at a long flight of stairs leading downward. Now, I was nervous. Even Robotnik seemed unsure of himself, though I pressed onward. As I led Robotnik down the stairs, I noticed that the walls had gotten a lot more darker and more reddish. The red torches are now an eerie blue. Then we landed onto another hallway. This one was longer than the last one, or at least it felt like it. And then we headed down another flight of stairs down. This one was much longer. It took at least one full minute. And then I heard that horrid Kefka laugh again, and then the music slowly faded until it was quiet. As it did, the walls turned more dark red, and the torches were a black flame now. When Robotnik landed onto the third hallway, I noticed how he looked really creeped out, though he tried to hide it. I couldn't blame him. I was scared too. Suddenly, Sonic popped right in front of Robotnik the same way he did Knuckles and the Red Static. The Red Static lasted for about 15 seconds, and then it showed me a really unpleasant image. The image showed what seemed to be hyper-realistic Sonic standing in the darkness where you can only see his face while his head and torso faded into black. And when I say hyper-realistic, I mean he looks so real you could actually see the lines in his blue fur, as if you could actually feel the fur if you touch the screen. His face. God. The most horrifying smile I'd ever seen. And that's saying something, considering I saw that image at the start of the game. His eyes were wide and black and once again crying blood, which also looked hyper-realistic. There were two small glowing red dots in those black eyes staring right at me, as if staring into my mind. His grin was wide and demonic. It literally stretched to the sides of his face. Except Sonic had fangs. Very sharp fangs. Much like the Warhog's teeth, except more vicious looking. Somewhat yellowish, and from the look of it, he had stains of blood and small bits of flesh on his lips and fangs as if he ate some animal. I stared at that gruesome image for a good 30 seconds, never taking my eyes off it. I felt as if he was actually looking at me, smiling at me. That face. It just took 10 seconds for it to etch itself into my brain for good. Then the screen flickered with red static again three times, and on the third time, I heard the Kefka laugh. Except this time, it sounded distorted, demonic even. It went back to the image again, except this time there was text, though it was messed up. But it was pretty much one of the most horrifying things I looked at since I had this game. I am God. It was when I read that message while looking at Sonic when it hit me. I realized right there and then, this Sonic was a monster. Monster. 
a pure, evil, sadistic, all-powerful, nightmarish, demented monster. And all of his victims, including Tails, Knuckles, Robotnik, and possibly Kyle, are just his little toys. And the game is a very gateway into his chaotic, nightmarish world, and the very hell his victims are trapped in. Suddenly, in an actual split second, I screamed as Sonic lunged at the screen, screeching loudly with his mouth wide open to an unnatural length revealing nothing but a literal spiraling abyss of pure darkness before the red static came again, this time much louder and distorted, so loud that it hurt my ears. I yelled and grabbed my ears as the red static screeched for a good 7 seconds. Then it stopped and showed nothing but a black screen. As I sat there staring at the black screen, one last text came up. Ready for round 2, Tom? The Kefka laugh, now sounding more clear as if Sonic was right behind me, played again 3 times as I looked at that text in shock and confusion. Then I got booted back to the main menu and this time, the third save file had a TV image of Robotnik in the same tormented state as Tails and Knuckles. Robotnik's skin turned a dull gray, his mustache drooped and had blackened, his glasses broke and blood coming from them, and he had a mere dead-like expression on his face. I looked at Tails, Knuckles, and Robotnik, and I cried a bit. I pity them for the agony they're going through. They were forever trapped within the game, forever tormented by that horrid hedgehog, and always will be. Then the computer shut itself off. I couldn't turn it back on no matter what I did. I sat there for maybe 25 seconds, horrified by what had just happened. Sonic is the very embodiment of evil. He tortures people who play his game in more ways than one, and then when he gets bored, he drags you into the game, literally drags you to hell, where he can play with you always as his toy. I can't get the game out of my computer. I think it's stuck in there, but at least I managed to turn it back on now. After I sat there for 25 seconds, I heard a voice right behind me, like a whisper. Try to keep this interesting for me, Tom. I turned around to see where the voice came from, and what I saw made me scream. Sitting on my bed, staring at me, was a Sonic plushie, smiling, with blood stains under its eyes. In appearance, Sonic.exe is almost identical to the established Sonic the Hedgehog character, a stylized bipedal hedgehog with famously spiked blue hair and a welcoming smile. The big difference is that in the EXE version, the character's eyes are missing, replaced instead with dark pits, through which a single point of red light is shining while blood or a dark liquid leaks down the cheeks. This motif of the empty eye sockets and bleeding eyes is again reminiscent of the Ben Drowned creepypasta, while the absence of the eyes is similar to the character Eyeless Jack. The EXE version of Sonic also has noticeably less neat hair spikes, and in depictions where his teeth can be seen, always has yellowed fang-like teeth. His limbs are also notably blackening as if to suggest some form of decay. The Sonic.exe creepypasta was originally written by JC the Hyena. In a post describing how he came up with the creepypasta, the originator explains that his inspiration came from a Photoshop screen capture image of the holding screen for Sonic the Hedgehog in which the character has the aforementioned eye injuries but retains the sadistic smile. In the post, JC the Hyena implies that he was also the creator of the original image, though that hasn't been confirmed. The story inspired by the image was posted by JC the Hyena to the Creepypasta Wiki on 9th of August 2011. Almost a year to the day later, a game based upon the Creepypasta story was released by MY5T Crimson on Game Jolt. This was followed by a reading of the story by YouTuber Mr. Creepypasta. Though the story's popularity really skyrocketed after YouTuber PewDiePie did a playthrough of the game based upon it, with the video garnering over 7 million views. Building upon the success of the original Creepypasta, JC the Hyena made several further posts explaining the nature of the character, likening the entity to something closer to a demon, and underlining the fact that the creature is not simply a human or ghost. Despite its massive following and status as a common theme for fan art on sites like DeviantArt, the original creepypasta of Sonic.exe was removed from the site when it was deemed to be of low quality and criticized for having too many cliches. Creator JC the Hyena was less than impressed with this removal, announcing it in a blog post on the 14th of January 2014. The subsequent reaction to this removal, which involved trying to get fans to protest to have it reinstated on the site and blocking people who leveled any negative comments in his direction, was criticized. The creator later apologized for his reaction and in 2017 posted a complete remake of the story. This second incarnation begins in exactly the same way, but now more explicitly identifies the Sonic.exe character as an eldritch abomination. The Sonic.exe character and story are examples of an established subgenre within creepypasta, which relates to cursed or haunted video games. The prevalence of the story model within the creepypasta genre as a whole may be due to a likelihood of shared audiences, or video games, DeviantArt, and creepypasta content, and also because it's a modern update of an established trope. Sonic.exe also plays a common device used by creepypasta writers, namely the adoption and subversion of established or primarily benevolent characters, taking beloved figures and giving them an evil or menacing element, or creating an alternate evil version of a well-loved character.
So that was one of my personal favorite creepypastas of all time, just because the fact that it was actually a real game and this is just a nostalgic factor. Without the nostalgic factor, it's still a good creepypasta story. For that one, I actually provided the gameplay footage in the background, so credit to the person that I got the gameplay footage from, but I tried uh, making it line up with whatever I was saying in the story, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. I think it was a little bit corny. Word of the video was corny, by the way. I think it was a little bit corny when it got to the, like, the Sonic plushie behind me. It's like, bruh, that specific laugh that they use for Sonic.exe, it's no longer known as the original audio file because I think it said in the in the story that it was from a Final Fantasy character. So that laugh is now known as Sonic.exe. Let's head on over to Eyeless Jack. Eyeless Jack, written by Azelf5000. Hello, my name is Mitch. I'm here to tell you guys about an experience I had. I don't know if it was paranormal or whatever stupid words people use to describe supernatural phenomena, but after that thing visited me, I believe in that paranormal trash now. A week after I moved in with my brother Edwin, after my house was foreclosed, I finished unpacking. Edwin liked the idea of me moving in. Since we hadn't seen each other for 10 years, I was so excited too. I soon fell asleep after I moved in. After that first week, I heard rustling noises coming from the outside at about 1 in the morning. I thought it was a raccoon, so I ignored it and tried to fall asleep. The next morning, I told Edwin about it, and he agreed. The next night, however, I thought I heard my window opening and a loud thump as if something entered my room. I darted up and looked around my room, but I saw nothing. The next morning, Edwin dropped his coffee cup when he saw me. He held up a nearby mirror and I saw myself. I had a large gash in my left cheek. After I was rushed to the hospital, my doctor told me that I must have been sleepwalking, but then he showed me something that made my blood turn cold. He lifted up my shirt to reveal a sewn up incision where my kidneys were. I stared into his eyes, mind widening. You somehow lost your left kidney last night, my doctor told me. We don't know how though. Sorry, Mitch. The next night was my breaking point. Around midnight, I woke up to see a truly horrifying sight. I was staring face to face with a creature with a black hoodie and a dark blue mask with no nose or mouth staring down at me. The thing that scared me the most was that it had no eyes, just empty black sockets. The creature also had some black substance dripping from its sockets. I grabbed the camera from the nearby mantle and took a picture. Immediately after taking the shot, the creature lunged at me and tried to claw open my chest to get into my lungs. I stopped it by kicking it in the face. As I ran out of my room, I grabbed my wallet. I wouldn't need the money. I ran out of my brother's house into the night. I eventually ended up in the woods near Edwin's house and tripped on a rock. I fell unconscious and woke up in the hospital. My doctor, the same one who treated me before, entered the room. I have good news and bad news, Mitch. My doctor started. The good news is that you had minor injuries and your parents are going to pick you up. I sighed with relief. The bad news is that your brother has been killed by something. Sorry. My parents took me back to Edwin's house to collect my remaining belongings, which I did. Upon entering my room, I was scared, but remained calm. I grabbed my camera and then stopped dead in my tracks. In the hallway leading to my room, I saw Edwin's body and something small lying next to it. I retrieved it and entered my parents' car, not mentioning Edwin's corpse. I looked at the thing I had picked up and nearly vomited. I was holding my stolen, half-eaten kidney with some black substance on it. One of the most notorious mainstream creepypasta villains, Eyeless Jack, is a humanoid entity who removes the organs of his victims and eats them. The character's moniker comes from the fact that he appears in a hoodie, wearing a blue mask open at the eye sockets, which though they are leaking a black fluid, are entirely empty. In later fan-made variants on the original story, Eyeless Jack is commonly found standing at the foot of the bed or leaning over his sleeping victim. In most depictions, Eyeless Jack wears a blue mask and hoodie, there are two black holes where the eyes should be, while the rest of the facial features are either missing entirely or only suggested in shape. The image most commonly associated with the character is a photograph taken from below, as if it's looking up at a blank face figure with only two gaping holes where the eyes should be. This photograph, which predates production of the actual story of Eyeless Jack, was created on November 19th, 2009 by two different art users, Nick NickTZ408 and Pirate Cashew. The image was then posted by a user calling himself Arnon on the 4chan, amongst a collection of creepy images taken from video games that he claimed to have found on 4chan slash vboard. The collection was labeled as Nightmare Fuel and significantly featured the DeviantArt image of the as yet nameless character. The image was posted on June 7th, 2010, and wouldn't be attached to a story until February 2012. Like many creepypasta characters, there was an ekphrastic element to Eyeless Jack's creation, meaning that the actual story of Eyeless Jack came after or was inspired by the image. That story was eventually posted to Creepypasta by a user named Azelf5000 on February 25th, 2012, and was presented as a first-person account of an encounter with Eyeless Jack, detailing how he had stolen and at least partially eaten human organs. The story gained in popularity, helped by the reading on YouTube by Mr. Creepypasta in March of 2012. Interestingly, the original the original creepypasta was removed by its creator in the wake of the original Jeff the Killer story being removed, with its author expressing a desire to remove it himself before the advent of the site could. Short story, huh? I actually really like this one. I think it's straight to the point, very simple. I think the, the, the art is amazing, like that original image I should say. The original image is amazing, and uh, the best, I feel like the best creepypastas are the ones with real factors. Like Sonic.exe was fire because there was an actual game a couple years later, 
or I think one year later. And with Isla's Jack, that image was made before the story. Someone got inspired by the image and gave it a story. So I think it's always nice to provide a, a visual. It's always nice to provide a visual. Though I know every creepypasta ends up getting a visual because fan art is made after, if it's popular enough. There's something different when it's like an original image before the story. It just adds another fear factor. Let's head on to Jeff the Killer. Jeff the Killer. Excerpt from local newspaper. Ominous unknown killer is still at large. After weeks of unexplained murders, ominous unknown killer is still on the rise. After little evidence has been found, a young boy states that he has survived one of the killer's attacks and bravely tells his story. I had a bad dream and I woke up in the middle of the night. I saw that for some reason the window was open, even though I remember it being closed before I went to bed. I got up and shut it once more. Afterwards, I simply crawled under my covers and tried to get back to sleep. That's when I had a strange feeling, like someone was watching me. I looked up and nearly jumped out of my bed. There, and a little ray of light illuminating between my curtains were a pair of two eyes they weren't regular eyes they were dark ominous eyes they were bordered in black and just plain out terrified me that's when i saw his mouth a long horrendous smile that made every hair on my body stand up the figure stood there watching me finally after what seemed like forever he said it a simple phrase but said only in a way a madman could speak he said go to sleep I let out a scream. That's what sent him at me. He pulled up a knife, aiming it at my heart. He jumped on top of my bed. I fought him back. I kicked, I punched, I rolled around, tried to knock him off me. That's when my dad busted in. The man threw the knife. It went into my dad's shoulder. The man probably would have finished him off if one of the neighbors hadn't alerted the police. They drove into the parking lot and ran towards the door. The man turned and ran down the hallway. I heard a smash, like glass breaking. As I came out of my room, I saw the window that was pointing towards the back of my house was broken. I looked out at it to see him vanish into the distance. I can tell you one thing. I will never forget that face, those cold, evil eyes, and that psychotic smile. They'll never leave my head. Police are still on the look for this man. If you see anyone that fits the description of his story, please contact your local police department. Jeff and his family had just moved into a new neighborhood. His dad had gotten a promotion at work, and they thought it would be best to live in one of those quote, fancy neighborhoods. Jeff and his little brother Liu couldn't complain though. A new, better house. What well, wasn't to love? As they were getting unpacked, one of their neighbors came by. Hello, she said. I'm Barbara. I live across the street from you. Well, I just wanted to introduce myself and to introduce my son. She turns around and calls her son over. Billy, these are our new neighbors. Billy said hi and ran back to play in his yard. Well, said Jeff's mom, I'm Margaret, and this is my husband Peter and my two sons Jeff and Liu. They introduced themselves and then Barbara invited them to her son's birthday. Jeff and his brother were about to object when their mother said that they would love to. When Jeff and his family were done packing, Jeff went up to his mom. Mom, why would you invite us to some kid's party if you haven't noticed I'm not some dumb kid. Jeff, said his mother, we just moved here. We should show that we want to spend time with our neighbors. Now, we're going to that party and that's final. Jeff started to walk but stopped himself, knowing that he couldn't do anything. When his mom said something, it was final. He walked up to his room and plopped down on his bed. He sat there looking at his ceiling when suddenly he had a weird feeling. Not so much pain, but a weird feeling. He dismissed it as just a random feeling. He heard his mother call him down to get his stuff and he walked down to get it. The next day, Jeff walked downstairs to get breakfast and got ready for school. As he sat there, he once again got that feeling. This time it was stronger. It gave him a slight tugging pain, but he once again dismissed it. As he and Liu finished breakfast, they walked down to the bus stop. They sat there waiting for the bus, and then, all of a sudden, some kid on a skateboard jumped over them, only inches above their laps. They both jumped back in surprise. Hey, what the hell? The kid landed and turned back to them. He kicked the skateboard up and caught it with his hands. The kid seemed to be about 12, one year younger than Jeff. He wears an Aeropostle shirt and ripped blue jeans. Well, well, well. It looks like we got some new meat. Suddenly, two other kids appeared. One was super skinny and the other was huge. Well, since you're new here, I'd like to introduce ourselves. Over there is Keith. Jeff and Liu looked over to the skinny kid. He had a dopey face that you would accept the sidekick to have. And he's Troy. They looked over at the fat kid. Talk about a tub of lard. This kid looked like he had an exercise since he was crawling. And I, said the first kid, am Randy. Now, for all the kids in this neighborhood, there's a small price for bus fare, if you catch my drift. Liu stood up, ready to punch the lights out of the kid's eyes when one of his friends pulled a knife on him. I hoped you would be more cooperative, but it seems we must do this the hard way. The kid walked up to Liu and took his wallet out of his pocket. Jeff got that feeling again. Now it was truly strong, a burning sensation. He stood up, but Liu gestured him to sit down. Jeff ignored him and walked up to the kid. Listen here, you little punk. Give back my brother's wallet or else. Randy put the wallet in his pocket and pulled out his own knife. Oh, and what will you do? Just as he finished the sentence, Jeff popped the kid in the nose. As Randy reached for his face, Jeff grabbed the kid's wrist and broke it. Randy screamed and Jeff grabbed the knife from his hand. Troy and Keith rushed Jeff, but Jeff was too 
quick, he threw Randy to the ground. Keith lashed out at him, but Jeff ducked and stabbed him in the arm. Keith dropped his knife and fell to the ground screaming. Troy rushed him too, but Jeff didn't even need the knife. He just punched Troy straight in the stomach and Troy went down. As he fell, he puked all over. Leo could do nothing but look in amazement at Jeff. Jeff, how'd you? Was all he said. They saw the bus coming and knew they'd be blamed for the whole thing. So they started running as fast as they could. As they ran, they looked back and saw the bus driver rushing over to Randy and the others. As Jeff and Liu made it to school, they didn't dare tell what happened. All they did was sit and listen. Liu just thought of that as his brother beating up a few kids, but Jeff knew it was more. It was something scary. As he got that feeling, he felt how powerful it was. The urge to just hurt someone. He didn't like how it sounded, but he couldn't help feeling happy. He felt that strange feeling go away and stay away for the entire day of school. Even as he walked home due to the whole thing near the bus stop and how now he probably wasn't going to be taking the bus anymore, he felt happy. When he got home, his parents asked him how his day was and he said in a somewhat ominous voice, it was a wonderful day. Next morning, he heard a knock at his front door. He walked down to find two police officers at his door, the mother looking back at him with an angry look. Jeff, these officers tell me that you attacked three kids, that it wasn't regular fighting, and that they were stabbed. Stabbed, son. Jeff's gaze fell to the floor, showing his mother that it was true. Mom, they were the ones that pulled the knives on me and Liu. Son, said one of the cops, we found three kids, two stabbed, one having a bruise on his stomach, and we have witnesses proving that you fled the scene. Now, what does that tell us? Jeff knew it was no use. He could say him and Liu had been attacked, but then there was no proof of them not being attacked in the first place. They couldn't say they weren't fleeing because truth be told, they were. So Jeff couldn't defend himself or Liu. Son, call down your brother. Jeff couldn't do it since it was he who beat up all the kids. Sir, it, it was me. I was the one who beat up the kids. Liu tried to hold me back, but he couldn't stop me. The cop looked at his partner and they both nod. Well, kid, it looks like a year in Juve. Wait, says Liu. They all looked up to see him holding a knife. The officers pulled their guns and locked them on Liu. It was me. I beat up those little punks. I have the marks to prove it. He lifted up his sleeves to reveal cuts and bruises as if he was in a struggle. Son, just put the knife down, said the officer. Liu held up the knife and dropped it to the ground. He put his hands up and walked over to the cops. No, Liu, it was me. I did it. Jeff had tears running down his face. Huh. Poor bro. Can I take the blame for what I did? Well, take me away. The police led Liu out to the patrol car. Liu, tell them it was me. Tell them. I was the one who beat up those kids. Jeff's mother put her hands on his shoulders. Jeff, please. You don't have to lie. We know it's Liu. You can stop. Jeff watched helplessly as the cop car speeds off with Liu inside. A few minutes later, Jeff's dad pulled into the driveway, seeing Jeff's face and knowing something was wrong. Son? Son, what is it? Jeff couldn't answer. His vocal cords were strained from crying. Instead, Jeff's mother walked his father inside to break the bad news to him as Jeff wept in the driveway. After an hour or so, Jeff walked back to the house, seeing that his parents were both shocked, sad, and disappointed. He couldn't look at them. He couldn't see how they thought of Liu when it was his fault. He just went to sleep, trying to get the whole thing off his mind. Two days went by, with no word from Liu at JBC, no friends to hang out with, nothing but sadness and guilt. That is, until Saturday, when Jeff is woken up by his mother with a happy, sunshiny face. Jeff, it's the day, she said as she opened up the curtains and let light flood into his room. What? What's today? Asked Jeff as he stirs awake. Why, it's Billy's party. He was now fully awake. Mom, you're joking, right? You don't expect me to go to some kid's party after... There was a long pause. Jeff, we both know what happened. I think this party could be the thing that brightens up the past few days. Now get dressed. Jeff's mother walked out of the room and downstairs to get ready herself. He fought himself to get up. He picked out a random shirt and pair of jeans and walked downstairs. He saw his mother and father all dressed up. His mother in a dress and his father in a suit. He thought, why would they wear such fancy clothes to a kid's party? Son, is that all you're going to wear? Said Jeff's mom. Better than wearing too much, he said. His mother pushed down the feeling to yell at him and hit it with a smile. Now son, we may be overdressed, but this is how you go if you want to make an impression said his father. Jeff grunted and went back up to his room. I don't have fancy clothes, he yelled downstairs. Just pick out something, called his mother. He looked around in his closet for what he could call fancy. He found a pair of black dress pants he had for special occasions and an undershirt. He couldn't find a shirt to go with it though. He looked around and found only striped and patterned shirts, none of which go with dress pants. Finally, he found a white hoodie and put it on. You're wearing that? They both said. His mother looked at her watch. Oh, no time to change. Let's just go. She said as she herded Jeff and his father out the door. They crossed the street over to Barbara and Billy's house. They knocked on the door and it appeared that Barbara, just like his parents, was way overdressed. As they walked inside, all Jeff could see were adults, no kids. The kids are out in the yard. Jeff, how about you go and meet some of them, said Barbara. Jeff walked outside to a yard full of kids. They were running around in weird cowboy costumes and shooting each other with plastic guns. He might as well be standing in a Toys R Us. Suddenly, a kid came up to him and handed him a toy gun and hat. Hey, wanna play? He said. Ah, no kid, I'm, I'm too old for this stuff. The kid looked at him with a weird puppy dog face. Please, said the kid. Fine, said Jeff. He put on the hat and started to pretend to shoot at the kids. At first, he thought it 
it was totally ridiculous. But then he started to actually have fun. It might not have been super cool, but it was the first time he had done something that took his mind off Liu. So he played with the kids for a while until he heard a noise, a weird rolling noise. Then it hit him. Randy, Troy, and Keith all jumped over the fence on their skateboards. Jeff dropped the fake gun and ripped off the hat. Randy looked at Jeff with a burning hatred. Hello, Jeff, is it? He said, we have some unfinished business. Jeff saw his bruised nose. I think we're even. I beat the crap out of you and you got my brother sent to JDC. Randy got an angry look in his eyes. Oh no, I don't go for even. I go for winning. And you may have kicked our asses that one day, but not today. As he said that, Randy rushed at Jeff. They both fell to the ground. Randy punched Jeff in the nose and Jeff grabbed them by the ears and headbutted him. Jeff pushed Randy off of him and both rose to their feet. Kids were screaming and parents were running out of the house. Troy and Keith both pulled guns out of their pockets. No one interrupts or guts will fly, they said. Randy pulled a knife on Jeff and stabbed it into his shoulder. Jeff screamed and fell to his knees. Randy started kicking him in the face. After three kicks, Jeff grabs his foot and twists it, causing Randy to fall to the ground. Jeff stood up and walked towards the back door. Troy grabbed him. Need some help? He picks Jeff up by the back of the collar and throws him into the patio door. As Jeff tries to stand, he's kicked down to the ground. Randy repeatedly starts kicking Jeff until he starts to cough up blood. Come on, Jeff, fight me. He picks Jeff up and throws him into the kitchen. Randy sees a bottle of vodka on the counter and smashes the glass over Jeff's head. Fight! He throws Jeff back into the living room. Come on, Jeff, look at me. Jeff glances up, his face riddled with blood. I was the one who got your brother sent to JDC, and now you're just gonna sit here and let him rot in there for a whole year? You should be ashamed. Jeff starts to get up. Oh, finally! You stand and fight. Jeff is now on his feet, blood and vodka on his face. Once again, he gets that strange feeling, the one in which he hasn't felt for a while. Finally, he's up, says Randy as he runs at Jeff. That's when it happens. Something inside Jeff snaps. His psyche is destroyed. All rational thinking is gone. All he can do is kill. He grabs Randy and pile drives him to the ground. He gets on top of him and punches him straight in the heart. The punch causes Randy's heart to stop as Randy gasps for breath. Jeff hammers down on him, punch after punch. Blood gushes from Randy's body until he takes one final breath and dies. Everyone is looking at Jeff now. The parents, crying kids, even Troy and Keith. Although they easily break their gaze and point their guns at Jeff, Jeff sees the guns trained on him and runs for the stairs. As he runs, Troy and Keith both let out fire on him, each shot missing. Jeff runs up the stairs. He hears Troy and Keith follow up behind. As they let their final rounds of bullets off, Jeff ducks into the bathroom. He grabs a towel rack and rips it off the wall. Troy and Keith race in. Knives heavy. Troy swings his knife at Jeff, who backs away and bangs the towel rack into Troy's face. Troy goes down hard, and now all that's left is Keith. He is more agile than Troy, though, and ducks when Jeff swings the towel rack. He dropped the knife and grabbed Jeff by the neck. He pushed him into the wall. A thing of bleach fell down on top of him from the top shelf. It burnt both of them as they both started to scream. Jeff wiped his eyes as best he could. He pulled back the towel rack and swung it straight into Keith's head. As he lay there, bleeding to death, he let out an ominous smile. What's so funny? asked Jeff. Keith pulled out a lighter and switched it on. What's funny? he said, is that you're covered in bleach and alcohol. Jeff's eyes widened as Keith threw the lighter on him. As soon as the flame made contact with him, the flames ignited the alcohol and the vodka. While the alcohol burned him, the bleach bleached his skin. Jeff let out a horrible screech as he caught on fire. He tried to roll out the fire, but it was no use. The alcohol had made him a walking inferno. He ran down the hall and fell down the stairs. Everybody started screaming as they saw Jeff, which was now a man on fire, dropped to the ground, nearly dead. The last thing Jeff saw was his mother and the other parents trying to extinguish the fire. That's when he passed out. When Jeff woke, he had a cast wrapped around his face. He couldn't see anything, but he felt a cast on his shoulder and stitches all over his body. He tried to stand up, but realized that there was some tube in his arm, and when he tried to get up, it fell out, and a nurse rushed in. I don't think you could get out of bed just yet, she said as she put him back in his bed and reinserted the tube. Jeff sat there with no vision, no idea of what his surroundings were. Finally, after hours, he heard his mother. Honey, are you okay? She asked. Jeff couldn't answer though. His face was covered, and he was unable to speak. Oh, honey, I have great news. After all the witnesses told the police that Randy confessed of trying to attack you, they decided to let Lee go. This made Jeff almost bolt up, stopping halfway, remembering the tube coming out of his arm. He'll be out by tomorrow, and then you two will be able to be together again. Jeff's mother hugs Jeff and says her goodbye. The next couple of weeks were those where Jeff was visited by his family, and then came the day where his bandages were to be removed. Family members were all there to see it, what he looks like. As the doctors unwrapped the bandages from Jeff's face, everyone was on the edge of their seats. They waited until the last bandage holding the cover over his face was almost removed. Let's hope for the best, said the doctor. He quickly pulls the cloth, letting the rest fall from Jeff's face. Jeff's mother screams at the sight of his face. Liu and Jeff's dad stare awestruck at his face. What? What happened to my face? Jeff said. He rushed out of the bed and ran into the bathroom. He looked in the mirror and saw the cause of the distress. His face. It it's horrible. His lips were burnt to a deep shade of red. His face was turned into a pure white color, and his hair singed from brown to black. He slowly put his hand to his face. It had a sort of leathery feel to it now. He looked back at his family, then back to the mirror. Jeff, 
said Liu. It's not that bad. Not that bad, said Jeff. It's perfect. His family was equally surprised. Jeff started laughing uncontrollably. His parents noticed that his left eye and hand were twitching. Uh, Jeff? Are you okay? Okay? I've never felt more happy. <laughs> Look at me. This face goes perfectly with me. He couldn't stop laughing. He stroked his face, feeling it, looking at it in the mirror. What caused this? Well, you may recall that when Jeff was fighting Randy, something in his mind, his sanity, snapped. Now he was left as a crazy killing machine. That is, his parents didn't know. Doctor, said Jeff's mom, is my son all right? You know, in the head? Oh yes. This behavior is typical for patients that have taken very large amounts of painkillers. If his behavior doesn't change in a few weeks, bring him back here and we'll give him a cycle logical test. Oh, thank you, doctor. Jeff's mother went over to Jeff. Jeff, sweetie, it, it's time to go. Jeff looks away from the mirror. His face still formed into a crazy smile. His mother took him by the shoulder and took him to get his clothes. This is what came in, said the lady at the desk. Jeff's mom looked down to see the black dress pants and white hoodie her son wore. Now they were clean of blood and stitched together. Jeff's mother led him to his room and made him put his clothes on. Then they left, not knowing that was their final day of life. Later that night, Jeff's mother woke to a sound coming from the bathroom. It sounded as if someone was crying. She slowly walked over to see what it was. When she looked into the bathroom, she saw a horrendous Jeff had taken a knife and carved a smile into his cheeks. Jeff, what are you doing? Asked his mother. Jeff looked over to his mother. I couldn't keep smiling, mommy. It hurt after a while. Now I can smile forever. Jeff's mother noticed his eyes, ringed in black. Jeff, your eyes! His eyes were seemingly never closing. I couldn't see my face. I got tired and my eyes were starting to close. I burned out the eyelids so I could forever see myself. My new face! Jeff's mother slowly started to back away, seeing that her son was going insane. What's wrong, mommy? Aren't I beautiful? Yes, son, she said. Yes, you are. Let me, let me go get dad so he can see your face. She ran into the room and shook Jeff's dad from his sleep. Honey, get the gun, we. She stopped as she saw Jeff in the doorway holding a knife. Mommy, mommy, you lied. That's the last thing they hear as Jeff rushes them with the knife, gutting both of them. His brother Liu woke up, startled by some noise. He didn't hear anything else, so he just shut his eyes and tried to go back to sleep. As he was on the border of slumber, he got the strangest feeling that someone was watching him. He looked up before Jeff's hand covered his mouth. He slowly raised a knife, getting ready to plunge it into Liu. Liu thrashed here and there, trying to escape Jeff's grip. Shh. Jeff said, just go to sleep. So when it comes to the Jeff the Killer image, which is the most popular thing surrounding Jeff the Killer, not really the story itself, that image took a life of its own, you know, the main question is, where did the image come from? For some time, it was believed that the photograph was a Photoshop manipulated image of a girl identified as Katie Robinson. The story went that this young girl, who was considered by some internet trolls to be overweight, was eventually driven to suicide by online bullies. Her image was then photoshopped and used as a basis for the most widely known Jeff the Killer image. It's a tragic story, which though it exists entirely separate from the Jeff the Killer creepypasta, and even more sinister aspect and legitimate reason to find the image unnerving, depicting it as not only a deceased girl, but a victim of the same species of bullying that the fictional character endured. Fortunately, that's not really the story, it's just a rumor. The Kitty Robinson story and the entire idea that the Jeff the Killer image used the photograph of a deceased girl as its basis has been debunked. The girl featured in the photograph alleged to belong to the unfortunate Miss Robinson is actually a girl named Heather White, who has confirmed that the images alleged to have been manipulated have nothing to do with the famous image of Jeff the Killer. Another theory which gained traction in recent years is that the original photograph was of an unnamed stickum girl. This girl, who was alleged to have been crying for attention, was said to have used images in which the flash from her camera or monitor illuminated and overexposed her face, giving it the bleached out white appearance familiar to the Jeff the Killer images. Her image was subsequently screenshotted and adopted by another anonymous user, who then posed as her using her photograph to ask, am I pretty? Responding to what seemed to be a naked self-promotion or hunting for sympathy clicks, viewers of the image gradually added to a thread in which they manipulated the image, so that it gradually becomes more and more distorted. These Photoshop images are believed by some to have evolved into the original Jeff the Killer photographs, and that's one theory at least. So far, the farthest back anyone has been able to trace the image is to a Japanese site called PYA.cc, where two versions of the image were found, both faces are noseless, though one had added contour shading around the eyes and the area where the nose would be. It's also been noted that the two images have different eye shapes, with one looking more like the eyes from a stuffed toy or cartoon character. Hey, what's up guys? You like how I look <laughs> without the glasses? Jeff the Killer, one of the best stories on this list, I'd say. I know it speeds up very quick, even though it's a long story, but it's like, all of these stories are gonna speed up quick. We're not reading books here, we're reading creepypastas. I think it might be the best creepypasta of all time. Yep, I don't even know if that's a controversial opinion. I think that's pretty popular, honestly. Everything about the image and the image still not being known, like where, where it came from is so fascinating. I think that's always gonna keep the Jeff the Killer image relevant and always gonna make people curious as to what the story is, though I never really knew about that story. I, I didn't care. I always like was like the image was the cool thing. I really liked it. I fucked with it. I was going to not say fuck with it, but I realized I do cuss in this video. So yeah, I fucked with it. Have y'all noticed that I'm actually like putting effort into like my voice acting in, in, in this video? I don't know if y'all noticed, but 
I've been putting some effort into my voice acting. Y'all know I got a show coming out, a cartoon coming out by the end of this year. All right, stop. You guys don't have to remind me about Two Gay Cats. It's coming out by the end of this year. I promise you, if not early next year. But it's like we're working on it. Anyway, Jeff the Killer is the best creepypasta of all time. Anyway, let's head on to The Rake. The Rake by Brian Somerville. A suicide note, 1964. As I prepare to take my life, I feel it necessary to assuage any guilt or pain I have introduced through this act. It is not the fault of anyone other than him. For once I awoke and felt his presence, and once I awoke and saw his form, once again I awoke and heard his voice and looked into his eyes. I cannot sleep without fear of what I might next awake to experience. I cannot ever wake. Goodbye. Found in the same wooden box were two empty envelopes addressed to William and Rose, and one loose personal letter with no envelope. Dearest Linny, I have prayed for you. He spoke your name. A journal entry, translated from Spanish. 1880. I have experienced the greatest terror. I see his eyes when I close mine. They are hollow, black. They saw me and pierced me. His wet hand. I will not sleep. His voice. A mariner's log. 1691. He came to me in my sleep. From the foot of my bed, I felt a sensation. He took everything. We must return to England. We shall not return here again at the request of the rake. From a witness. 2006. Three years ago, I had just returned from a trip from Niagara Falls with my family for the 4th of July. We were all very exhausted after a long day of driving, so my husband and I put the kids right to bed and called it a night. At about 4 a.m., I woke up thinking my husband had gotten up to use the restroom. I used the moment to steal back the sheets, only to wake him in the process. I apologized and told him I thought he got out of bed. When he turned to face me, he gasped and pulled his feet up from the end of the bed so quickly his knee almost knocked me out of the bed. He then grabbed me and said nothing. After adjusting to the dark for half a second, I was able to see what caused a strange reaction. At the foot of the bed, sitting and facing away from us, there was what appeared to be a naked man or a large hairless dog of some sort. Its body position was disturbing and unnatural, as if it had been hit by a car or something. For some reason, I wasn't instantly frightened by it, but more concerned as to its condition. At this point, I was somewhat under the assumption that we were supposed to help him. My husband was peering over his arm and knee, tucked into the fetal position, occasionally glancing at me before returning to the creature. In a flurry of motion, the creature scrambled around the side of the bed and then crawled quickly in a flaming sort of motion right along the bed until it was less than a foot away from my husband's face. The creature was completely silent for about 30 seconds, or probably closer to 5, it just seemed like a while. It just was looking at my husband. The creature then placed its hand on its knee and ran to the hallway, leading to the kids' room. I screamed and ran for the light switch, planning to stop him before he hurt my children. When I got to the hallway, the light from the bedroom was enough to see it crouching and hunched over about 20 feet away. He turned around and looked directly at me covered in blood. I flipped the switch on the wall and saw my daughter Clara. The creature ran down the stairs while my husband and I rushed to help our daughter. She was very badly injured and spoke only once more in her short life. She said, he is the rake. My husband drove his car into the lake later that night while rushing our daughter to the hospital. He didn't survive. Being a small town, news got around pretty quickly. The police were helpful at first and the local newspaper took a lot of interest as well. However, the story was never published and the local television news never followed up either. For several months, my son Justin and I stayed in a hotel near my parents house. After we decided to return home, I began looking for answers myself. I eventually located a man in the next town who had a similar story. We got in contact and began talking about our experiences. He knew of two other people in New York who had seen the creature we now refer to as the rake. It took the four of us about two solid years of hunting on the internet and writing letters to come up with a small collection of what we believe to be counts of the rake. None of them gave any details, history, or follow-up. One journal had an entry involving the creature in its first three pages and never mentioned it again. A ship's log explained nothing of the encounter, saying only they were told to leave by the rake. That was the last entry in the log. There were, however, many instances where the creature's visit was one of a series of visits with the same person. Multiple people also mentioned being spoken to, my daughter included. This led us to wonder if the rake had visited any of us before our last encounter. I set up a digital recorder near my bed and left it running all night, every night for two weeks. I would tediously scan through the sounds of me rolling around in my bed each day when I woke up. By the end of the second week, I was quite used to the occasional sound of sleep while blurring through the recording at eight times the normal speed. This still took almost an hour every day. On the first day of the third week, I thought I heard something different. What I found was a shrill voice. It was the rake. I can't listen to it long enough to even begin to transcribe it. I haven't let anyone listen to it yet. All I know is that I've heard it before, and I now believe that it spoke when it was sitting in front of my husband. I don't remember hearing anything at the time, but for some reason, the voice on the recorder immediately brings me back to that moment. The thoughts that must have gone through my daughter's head make me very upset. I have not seen the rake since he ruined my life, but I know that he has been in my room while I slept. I know and fear that one night, I'll wake up to see him staring at me.
The rake is a name given to a strange pale-skinned creature that stalks its victims on all fours and has the appearance of somewhat resembling a mutated dog. The fanged and taloned creature is commonly said to live in the woods or forested areas. However, the spread of the character and the resulting lack of common rules around its habitat or behaviors means that it now has a far wider presence moving away from the woods and forests to be found in more urban areas and even repeating the common creepypasta trope of appearing at the end of people's beds or in their rooms at night. The common consensus of the creature's appearance shows that it has large bulbous eyes that are reflective when caught in the light of a camera, a drooping jaw with a large fang-filled mouth, and often either a nose that is missing entirely or which is simply an open socket similar to that of a skull. The creature is usually shown naked and crawling towards the viewer on all fours, suggesting that though it is bipedal, it prefers to stalk victims in a manner similar to a four-legged animal. The matter of the rake's appearance is an interesting one that's linked directly to the myth's origins and development to an image that had even the mainstream media dupe. In an origin story similar to that of the Slenderman, the mythic creature known as the rake originally evolved out of a 2005 thread on 4chan where an anonymous poster on the slash b-board suggested that the contributors try to collaboratively come up with ideas for a new monster. After some initial back and forth discussion, one particular idea was chosen as the most promising candidate and began to be formed, added to, and manipulated by several users. The descriptions of this creature, which went through numerous adumerations before finally settling, shared some characteristics with a commonly accepted rake image that is widespread today. However, there were also some glaring differences. For example, the original suggestions called for three eyes, while the most common version of the rake only has two, and for the creature to lack other facial features, having, for example, a missing nose or mouth. The first story to feature the rake appeared on Brian Somerville's personal blog on July 20th, 2006. Somerville, who was a regular user of the Something Awful site, provided a backstory for the rake, and with his story, cemented some of the more commonly accepted features of the creature's appearance. The story indicates that sightings of the rake-like creature date back as far as the 12th century, and that the creature can be linked to unexplained phenomena and sightings of cryptid-like beings in the northeastern United States. By late 2008, rake stories appeared on Live Journal. The story and variants featuring the rake appeared on Something Awful and 4chan by the following year and first appeared on the Paranormal subreddit in 2010. It later found its way into creepypasta forums and began to increase in popularity. A common misconception is that the appearance of the rake is based off the widely shared image of a creature with glowing eyes staring into the camera of a deer hunter that is sometimes referred to as the Berwick Monster. This image, which is now the most closely associated with the rake mythology and the common starting point from which most rake fan art and variants are derived, was actually taken seriously by mainstream media outlets when it first appeared. The still image, alleged to have been extracted from a memory card of a now broken night vision camera was posted to the wild game innovation site by someone claiming to have actually encountered the creature. The image and story of the strange encounter was then picked up by media outlets as Britain's The Daily Mail and NBC, which featured the image on a brief report on the alleged sighting on its morning show. However, rather than this image influencing the initial ideas of the rake's appearance, the timeline seems to indicate that the rake stories were retrospectively linked to this image. Since discussions of the creature's appearance, Somerville's original story, and the first postings to major creepypasta and paranormal sites predate the image's creation and appearance in news media. The association of the image with the character can most likely be attributed to the face that the image itself appeared in the same month as a single topic blog Tumblr account hoping to gather together all of the fan art, copy pasta, and sighting reports into one place. With fans of the rake story or those encountering it for the first time conflating the image with the story in an association that would continue to the present. Incidentally, despite some sites claiming that the Berwick monster photograph has never been authenticated or debunked, the image, which went viral and was spread on various platforms with posters alleging it was real, was in fact meant to be a depiction of a grim from the game Resistance 3. It was released by the company responsible for the game, and such has been revealed to be a hoax. The Rake. Another image that haunted mainstream media. I feel like you could argue that about Jeff the Killer. Like, people that don't even know about Jeff the Killer's story, they know the image though. And it's the same concept with The Rake. With it coming back every year that someone saw saw in their backyard with their deer camera it's like bro no that's just the classic rake image <laughs> personally i didn't like this story i'm gonna be honest i didn't really like uh the rake story it was too quick i feel like there's so much potential with this image you could do a lot more same with i would argue with isla's jack but isla's jack just is a cooler image so a little bias on that the rake is like it's a more haunting image and i feel like you could do a lot more I feel, and, uh, and by the way, guys, I there are multiple stories on each creepypasta. I just try to pick the most original. If I got, if you know, we can always make a part two where I talk about sub stories of each of the creepypastas. I know I didn't do Ben Drowned for this video. That's because it would have been the longest, and this video is already long enough. I don't even know what the watch time is going to be. Hope you guys are watching it all the way through. But yeah, if we ever do a part two, Ben Drowned, trust me, will be on there, and any anything I missed, basically. So yeah, let's head on over to Smile Dog. 
Smile Dog. I first met in person with Mary E in the summer of 2007. I had arranged with her husband of 15 years, Terrence, to see her for an interview. Mary had initially agreed, since I wasn't a newsman, but rather an amateur writer, gathering information for a few early college assignments and, if all went according to plan, some pieces of fiction. We scheduled the interview for a particular weekend when I was in Chicago on unrelated business, but at the last moment, Mary changed her mind and locked herself in the couple's bedroom, refusing to meet with me. For half an hour, I sat with Terrence as we camped outside the bedroom door, I listening and taking notes while he attempted fruitlessly to calm his wife. The things Mary said made little sense, but fit with the pattern I was expecting. Though I could not see her, I could tell from her voice that she was crying, and more often than not, her objections to speaking with me centered around an incoherent diatribe on her dreams, her nightmares. Terrence apologized profusely when we ceased the exercise, and I did my best to take it in stride. Recall that I wasn't a reporter in search of a story, but merely a curious young man in search of information. Besides, I thought at the time I could perhaps find another, similar case if I put my mind and resources to it. Mary E. was a sysop for a small Chicago-based bulletin board system in 1992 when she first encountered Smile.jpg, and her life changed forever. She and Terrence had been married for only five months. Mary was one of an estimated 400 people who saw the image when it was posted as a hyperlink on the BBS, though she's the only one who has spoken openly about the experience. The rest have remained anonymous, or are perhaps dead. In 2005, when I was only in 10th grade, Smile.jpg was first brought to my attention by my burgeoning interest in web-based phenomena. Mary was the most often cited victim of what is sometimes referred to as, quote, Smile.dog. The being Smile.jpg is reputed to display. What caught my interest, other than the obvious macabre elements of the cyber legend and my proclivity towards such things, was the sheer lack of information, usually to the point that people don't believe it even exists other than as a rumor or hoax. It's unique because, though the entire phenomenon centers on a picture file, that file is nowhere to be found on the internet. Certainly, many photo-manipulated simulacra litter the web, showing up with the most frequency on sites such as the image board 4chan, particularly the X-focused paranormal subboard. It's suspected these are fakes because they don't have the effect the true smile.jpg is believed to have, namely sudden onset temporal lobe epilepsy and acute anxiety. This purported reaction in the viewer is one of the reasons the phantom-like smile.jpg is regarded with such disdain, since it's patently absurd. Though depending on whom you ask, the reluctance to acknowledge smile.jpg's existence might be just as much out of fear as it is out of disbelief. Neither smile.jpg nor smile.dog is mentioned anywhere on Wikipedia, though the website features articles on such other, perhaps more scandalous shock sites as Two Girls One Cup. Any attempt to create a page pertaining to smile.jpg is instantly deleted, and it's done so by one of the encyclopedia's many admins. Encounters with smile.jpg are the stuff of internet legend. Mary E's story is not unique. There are unverified rumors of smile.jpg showing up in the early days of Usenet, and even one persistent tale that in 2002, a hacker flooded the forums of humor and satire website Something Awful with a deluge of smile.dog pictures, rendering almost half the forum's users at the time epileptic. It's also said that in the mid to late 90s that smile.jpg circulated on Usenet and as an attachment of a chain email with the subject SMILE. God loves you, in all caps. Yet, despite the huge exposure these stunts would generate, there are very few people who admit to having experienced any of them, and no trace of the file or any link has ever been discovered. Those who claim to have seen Smile.jpg often weakly joke that they were far too busy to save a copy of the picture to their hard drive. However, all alleged victims offer the same description of the photo, a dog-like creature, usually described as appearing similar to a Siberian husky, illuminated by the flash of the camera, sitting in a dim room, the only background detail that is visible being a human hand extending from the darkness near the left side of the frame. The hand is empty, but is usually described as beckoning. Of course, most attention is given to the dog, or dog creature, as some victims are more certain than others about what they claim to have seen. The muzzle of the beast is reputedly split in a wide grin, revealing two rows of very white teeth. Very straight, very sharp, very human-looking teeth. This is, of course, not a description given immediately after viewing the picture, but rather a recollection of the victims who claim to have seen the picture endlessly repeated in their mind's eye during the time they are, in reality, having epileptic fits. These fits are reported to continue indeterminably, often while the victims sleep, resulting in very vivid and disturbing nightmares. These may be treated with medication, though in some says it's more effective than others. Mary E., I assumed, was not on effective medication. That was why after my visit to her apartment in 2007, I sent out feelers to several folklore and urban legend oriented news groups, websites, and mailing lists, hoping to find the name of a supposed victim of Smile.jpg, who felt 
more interested in talking about his experiences. For a time, nothing happened, and at length, I forgot completely about my pursuits, since I had begun my freshman year of college and I was quite busy. Mary contacted me via email, however, near the beginning of March 2008, added by Moose Juice to jml at dot com from Mary E at dot net subject last summer's interview dear mr l i am incredibly sorry about my behavior last summer when you came to interview me i hope you understand that it was no fault of yours but rather my own problems that led me to act out as i did i realized that i could have handled the situation more decorously however i hope you will forgive me at the time i was afraid you see for 15 years i've been haunted by smile.jpg smile.dog comes to me in my sleep every night i know that sounds silly but it's true there's an ineffable quality about my dreams my nightmares that makes them completely unlike any real dreams that i've ever had I do not move and do not speak. I simply look ahead. The only thing ahead of me is the scene from that horrible picture. I see the beckoning hand and I see Smile Dog. It talks to me. It's not a dog, of course, though I'm not sure what it really is. It tells me it will leave me alone only if I do as it asks. All I must do, it says, is spread the word. That's how it phrases its demands. And I know exactly what it means. It wants me to show it to someone else. And I could. The week after my incident, I received in the mail a manila envelope with no return address. Inside was a three and a half inch floppy diskette without having to check. I knew precisely what was on it. I thought for a long time about my options. I could show it to a stranger, a co-worker. I could even show it to Terrence. As much as the idea disgusted me. And what would happen then? Well, if Smile Dog kept its word, I could sleep. Yet if it lied, what would I do? And who was to say something worse would not come for me if I did as the creature asked? So I did nothing for 15 years, though I kept the diskette hidden amongst my things. Every night for 15 years, Smile Dog has come to me in my sleep and demanded that I spread the word. For 15 15 years, I have stood strong, though there have been hard times. Many of my fellow victims on the BBS board, where I first encountered Smile.jpg, stopped posting. I heard some of them committed suicide. Others remain completely silent, simply disappearing off the face of the web. They are the ones I worry about the most. I sincerely hope you will forgive me, Mr. L, but last summer, when you contacted me and my husband about the interview, I was near the breaking point. I decided I was going to give you the floppy discount. I didn't care if Smile Dog was lying or not. I wanted it to end. You were a stranger, someone I had no connection with, and I thought I wouldn't feel sorrow when you took the disc as part of your research and sealed your fate. Before you arrived, I realized what I was doing was plotting to ruin your life. I couldn't stand the thought, and in fact, I still can't. I'm ashamed, Mr. L, and I hope this warning will dissuade you from further investigation of Smile.jpg. You may in time encounter someone who is, if not weaker than I, then wholly more depraved, someone who will not hesitate to follow Smile Dog's orders. Stop while you are still whole. Sincerely, Mary E. Terrence contacted me later that month with the news that his wife had killed herself. While cleaning up various things she'd left behind, closing email accounts and stuff like that, he happened upon the above message. He was a man in shambles. He wept as he told me to listen to his wife's advice. He'd found the diskette, he revealed, and burned it until it was nothing but a stinking pile of blackened plastic. The part that most disturbed him, however, was how the diskette had hissed as it melted, like some sort of animal, he said. I will admit, I was a little uncertain about how to respond to this. At first, I thought perhaps it was a joke, with the couple belatedly playing with the situation in order to get a rise out of me. A quick check of several Chicago newspapers' online obituaries, however, proved that Mary E. was indeed dead. There was, of course, no mention of suicide in the article. I decided that, for a time at least, I wouldn't further pursue the subject of Smile.jpg, especially since I had finals coming up at the end of May. But the world has odd ways of testing us. Almost a full year later, after I'd returned from my disastrous interview with Mary E., I received another email to jml at dot com from elza h i r eight two at dot com subject smile hello i found your email address through a mailing list your profile said you are interested in smile dog i have saw it it is not as bad as everyone says i have sent it to you here just spreading the word just spreading the word the final line chilled me to the bone according to my email client there was one file attachment called naturally smile dot jpeg i considered downloading it for some time it was most likely a fake i imagined and even if it wasn't i was never wholly convinced of smile dot JPEG's peculiar powers. Mary E's account had shaken me, yes, but she was probably mentally unbalanced anyway. After all, how could a simple image do what Smile.jpg was said to accomplish? What sort of creature was it that could break one's mind with only the power of the eye? And if such things were patently absurd, then why did the legend exist at all? If I downloaded the image, if I looked at it, and if Mary turned out to be correct, if Smile Dog came to me in my dreams demanding I spread the word, what would I do? Would I live my life as Mary had, fighting against the urge to give in until I died, or would I simply spread the word, eager to be put to rest?
rest? And if I chose the latter route, how could I do it? Whom would I burden in turn? If I went through with my earlier intention to write a short article about smile.jpg, I decided I could attach it as evidence. And anyone who read the article, anyone who took interest, would be affected. And even assuming the smile.jpg attached to the email was genuine, would I be capricious enough to save myself in that manner? Could I spread the word? Yes. Yes, I could. The Smile.Creepypasta, also often referred to as Smile.JPEG, concerns a supposedly cursed or demonic image of a Siberian husky with a menacing expression and an exaggeratedly large smile from a mouth seemingly filled with human teeth. According to the story, this image depicting, quote, Smile Dog is an image of a demon or evil spirit that then plagues and torments anyone who has looked upon it with horrendous visions and nightmares, impelling them to, quote, spread the word by sharing the image with others. The longer the victim continues without sharing the image, the more extreme the, quote, haunting becomes, and if the image isn't shared, then Smile Dog takes his true form, either killing the victim, driving them to the point of insanity, or in many versions, dragging them away to hell. The original image associated with the Smile.jpg slash Smile Dog Creepypasta shows a Siberian husky with what appears to be a heavily photoshopped mouth. The husky is gray black, and the image shows only the head and neck with prominent pointed ears. The eyes of the dog are illuminated by the camera flash so that they take on a glowing quality, and the manner in which the dog is looking directly into the lens as if posing for a portrait in a disturbingly human fashion. Most unsettling however is the smile, which aside from appearing too wide for the mouth, seems not to contain canine teeth but more human or primate. The origin of both the original image of the husky and the first appearance of the altered image are unknown, with their creator still being anonymous, a fact that only adds to the story's effectiveness by adding at least the suggestion that the image could have an origin other than somebody editing and posting an image of their dog. This inability to pin down the exact origin of the story also ties in with the meta elements of the creepypasta story itself, in which the narrator describes how the image cannot be traced, and references to it on popular websites or incidents linked to it seem to disappear or be suppressed, suggesting that there are forces that do not want the background of the image or information about its power to be discussed in a public forum. The general consensus on the first appearance of Creepypasta relating to the image is that it first appeared in 2008 on the 4chan X board, though even this origin remains frustratingly nonspecific and unclear. Following the initial posting, the story spread becomes a little clearer. In 2009, a post on Urban Dictionary gave an explanation of the story as a definition for the term smile.jpg. In April 2010, a thread was opened by anonymous Ethan on movie codec forums discussing the image and story. Here, the idea that the image's origin was unclear was again underscored by the poster. Later that same year, a live action video about the story was uploaded to YouTube by a user known as Saboom, and on the 27th of August, the story got its own page on Creepypasta Wiki. The Smile Dog Creepypasta is built around a number of long established tropes. The first is the concept of chain letters. These are letters sent mostly anonymously, which contain an instruction or inducement to spread or send on the letter on its message often with either the promise of some reward or a threat of some mishap or bad luck befalling the receiver if they refuse to send the message on and continue the chain. Originally, actual letters sent by snail mail, this concept has evolved to encompass viral emails and Facebook posts, but work in precisely the same way. While the addition of a haunted supernatural or curse element has long been an established feature of some old school physical chain letters, one of the more notable examples of this in an internet form and possible precursor of the Smile JPEG story was the story of Carmen Winstead and the alternative name Jessica Smith that surfaced on Facebook in 2006 about a girl who had died in a sewer. The post insisted that if the reader didn't share the post to a specific number of people that they would be haunted by Carmen slash Jessica, a familiar template and one that reoccurs in Smile JPEG. The other significant tropes in the story, the idea of pursued by a demon or malevolent entity, and the idea that this activity can be started or halted by passing on a particular artifact is a common one within popular culture. And the theme of numerous horror movies from The Ring to the more comedic Drag Me to Hell, and more recently, It Follows. Part of the effectiveness of the Smile.jpg creepypasta and image being creepy is due to its ability to induce a feeling known as the uncanny in viewers. This is mostly attributable to the dog's smile and its apparent need for CBD for pets. In the effect similar to the unsettling effect caused by a clown's painted smile, psychologists suggest that smiles that are too wide or which show all the teeth produce a feeling of anxiety within the onlooker as it subconsciously suggests predation or aggression. Smile Dog, one of my personal favorites. I think it's like right below Jeff the Killer for me. I, I, it's either Sonic.exe or Smile Dog, but Jeff the Killer is number one for me. So with Smile Dog, it was the first one I read for this video, and it gave me a really good impression of what to look forward to, as in creepypastas. This one was not that corny. I was afraid that they were all going to be somewhat corny, but this one was actually this one was actually pretty cool. The concept of turning something so innocent, like a husky, 
into this horrifying image that again, like the Jeff the Killer image and the rake image are known above the creepypasta community. If you have not seen that image of that demon dog, you lying. You are lying. And I really like the little shout out. I don't know if they did it on purpose, but a little like shout out to Chainmail. That's pretty cool. It's a creepypasta. That's that, that, that. That's so cool. Now let's head on over to Slenderman. The Slenderman by Josh Dean. There it is again. What is that thing? I can't take this anymore. It's like everywhere I go, all I see is this horrible, tall, thin, and seemingly faceless creature. It's been haunting my dreams as well ever since I first saw it. All it does is stand there and watch me. I can't take this constant feeling of being watched. It's like I'm never alone. I hate it. I can't sleep, I can't go outside, and I can't function as a normal person anymore without it being there. I've done a lot of research on it in the last couple of days, googling what I can best describe it as. All I could remember was it being an impossibly tall, thin man. I say impossibly because no human could be that height and that thin. It's just not natural. I tried my best to remember its face. I figured that would help narrow the search, but there wasn't one. I have no memory of seeing this thing's face. It was always just a blur. But then, I could never look at it long enough without feeling uneasy. I usually just walked in the other direction or something. Or if it was a dream or a nightmare at that, I would always wake up before I could get a clear look. Well, the search provided me with something called the Slenderman. What the fuck is a Slenderman? This mythical creature is the thing that's been stalking me? No, it can't be. I, I refuse to believe that. I haven't left my house in two days. I've been held up reading all these Slenderman stories and accounts. Needless to say, sleep has eluded me for the duration. Nothing's going right anymore. I think I've angered it by not letting it in my dreams. I keep hearing banging on the windows late at night and creaking on the floorboards as I'm lying in bed. I know they say houses do that on their own, but this is different. The creaks aren't that of the house settling, there's weight behind them, like soft footsteps. However, every time I go look, there's nothing there. But when I re-enter my room, I always get the sensation I'm being watched. Tell me, have you ever been sitting in a room by yourself? windows and door closed, when suddenly the door opens for no reason? I think everyone has, but I'm different. I swear it's not the draft. I've had all the windows locked for about a week now. I'm not one to believe in ghosts or anything of that sort, but this just has an eerie feel to it. Whenever the door spontaneously opens, it gets noticeably colder in the room. The second I leave the room, however, all the other rooms are back to normal, so it's not like my thermostat's on the brink. Any room, however, except my own. My room has been getting cold recently, real cold. I resorted to lighting candles all around the room to try to heat up the place. I don't know what's happening. I'm starting to lose it. I went outside for the first time in over a week today. I thought maybe my delusions were coming from being cooped up and spending too much time scaring myself reading about the Slender Man. I went through my day-to-day -day life as best I could, and to my surprise, no sightings of that thing. Everything was going fine, in fact. I was starting to forget about the whole thing. That is, until I was heading home. I was walking through the woods, trying to take in as much fresh air as possible before I went home, and I stumbled across a piece of paper lying there in the middle of the footpath. I'd normally just have written it off to be some litter left by someone, but it was crisp white. It looked like it had been carefully placed there, no longer than perhaps 20 minutes ago. I picked it up and turned it over. It was a drawing. A drawing of that thing, the Slender Man. A very crude sketch depicted of him with the words, no, 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 scribbled down the sides of the page. As I tried to decipher the page, the clouds quickly darkened, turning into a heavy black. I best get home quick before the rain hits, I thought to myself. Now I'm home, sitting, staring at this fucking picture going out of my mind, trying to find out where it was, thinking about how new it looked, and wondering what sick fuck drew this and left it there for me. I'm just gonna go to bed. I'd better get some sleep. I swear that picture's cursed. Slender Man was in my dream again last night. It seemed so real. I was lying in my bed in the dream. I had woken up and seen him standing there in the corner of my room. I tried to scream, move, do anything, but I couldn't. I laid there, frozen in fear, wondering what would happen. He just lifted his arm and lifted it a good 10 feet to the headboard of my bed and rested his hand. I say hand, but they didn't feel like hands, more like tendrils, over my eyes and I went back to sleep. When I woke up, there was nothing. What a fucked up dream. Oh, and you know what else has been happening since I brought that picture home? My electronics have been fucking up. My laptop shuts down on its own. Even with full battery. My TV randomly turns to static, my phone keeps getting no reception, along with the opening of door, the constant sounds of footsteps at night. You got the picture. I'm burning it tonight. I'm taking it out to the back and setting the fucker alight. No, 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 th this can't be happening. I watched that get burned last night. I took that piece of paper outside last night and watched it burn. How is it back? What kind of twisted bastard would put a duplicate copy through someone's mailbox? This really isn't funny. I can't even phone for help because my electronics won't stop acting up and I'm too paranoid to leave this house. I don't know what to do. Things are getting too much to cope with now. Day after day, more and more of those damn pictures keep coming through. Nothing works in the house and I keep thinking I'm seeing him in the house. Whenever I leave the room, I think I catch a glimpse of him in my peripheral vision 
kitchen or in the corner of a mirror as I pass by, driving me insane. Has this thing really invaded my home? If so, there's no safety to be had. If it can get me here, it can get me anywhere. Doesn't mean I won't go down without a fight though. Okay, I've locked my doors and all the windows and took enough food and water from the kitchen to last me about a week. I'm gonna hold out in my room as long as possible. I don't feel safe outside, nor do I feel safe in my own home. This is my last resort. I know he's got something sinister in store for me. I just know it. Why else would he go to such lengths to scare me to the brink of my sanity? Well, I've barricaded myself in my room for now. Nothing's getting in here without my say-so. It's getting late. I'm gonna try to get some shut-eye. Shit, what was that? I swear I heard something move. It must have because it woke me up. This is no ordinary footstep that I heard at the beginning of all of this. Oh no, that was a loud and deliberate thud. It must be messing with me. The Slender Man knows I'm here. I would get up out of bed to turn the light on, but there's no point. He's been messing with the electrics. I lay here, scared out of my mind, staring into total darkness. I know this sounds like crazy, but have you ever seen a darker shade of black than normal? Like when you're in a dark room with only a little light and everything casts a shadow, but some shadows are darker than the others? I swear, even though I'm currently in near blind darkness, that corner is darker than the rest. It's the same corner that was in my last nightmare. It's like the darkness is moving. My night vision is getting better now. I can see it in more detail. Oh no. No, 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 no. I can see an outline of a man forming that corner. A really tall, thin man. It looks like he's wearing a suit. Oh god, it's him. He's here. J just like my dream. I lay here, frozen in fear, wondering what's gonna happen. He lifts his arm and stretches it across my room and over to my head. He rests his hands. No, these aren't hands. These are these are tendrils on my forehead. I thought about grabbing his arm and trying to push away or getting up out of my bed and trying to break down the door, but something told me there's no use. Nothing would help me now. His tendrils grew into length and snaked down my entire body, slowly wrapping themselves around me into some sort of blackened cocoon. Before I could scream, the blackness reached my face and covered my mouth. As it enveloped my head, the last thing to be covered was my eyes, which were firmly shut the whole time. I decided to open them one last time. I looked directly up, and he was there, standing directly over me. Looking down, that was the last thing I saw before the darkness claimed me. Although he has no face, I swear he seemed to smile. Though adaptation and modification by various authors means that Slenderman's appearance can vary somewhat depending upon the source. The most common features remain the same. The character is usually depicted as an abnormally tall humanoid, usually wearing a dark suit and tie. Slenderman's face is almost always completely featureless and often either white or pale gray, though in some depictions his blank face does feature an animalistic mouth. Slenderman is often said to be able to extend or stretch his limbs, particularly his arms at will, and either has tentacles protruding, just visible from his back, or has tentacle-like appendages in place of his arms. The character the character commonly inhabits liminal spaces, such as the entrance to woods and forests, or areas of abandoned ground on the outskirts of more populated areas. While there's a wide variety of Slenderman stories out there, much of the character's effectiveness comes from the fact that there's no single definitive version. The initial post that introduced the character being only fragmentary quotes linked to an image rather than an actual short story or a complete narrative. Though the details alter, some elements seem to remain as constants, such as the character appearing by woods or forests, enticing children away from their parents and friends, never to be seen again. Another common trope that the Slenderman exerts is an influence upon the victims, making them perpetrators of crimes or violent actions. The character has also been said to cause illness, particularly a cough known as, quote, slender sickness, and to induce those who encounter him to suicide. These latter features, namely enticement to violence or suicide, became more prevalent and commonly associated with the character in a case of art imitating life after real violent events or cases of attempted suicide were linked to the character. Despite some media outlets adding to the aura of the Slenderman mythos by claiming that the figure's origins are unclear, in fact, the character's origin is easily traceable. Slenderman in his original form was created by Eric Knudsen under the alias Victor Surge. Knudsen was responding to a call on Something Awful for posters to contribute digitally altered photographs that would then serve as the basis for new mythologies or stories. Knudsen's effort, posted on June 10th, 2009, showed groups of teenagers and children with the now familiar figure of Slenderman standing in the background. At first glance, the images seem normal, but the figure's anomalous size and featureless face once noticed gives the pictures an eerie and unsettling feeling. Alongside the images, Knudsen provided small snippets of out-of-context text purported to be witness accounts that give hints about the scenes depicted and their relation to the anomalous figure of the Slenderman. By attaching short snippets of text with his images, Knudsen transformed the lone image into the first Slenderman story, albeit in a non-linear and fragmentary form. Following this initial appearance, the Slenderman character was then picked up by other users, who either fit him into their own narratives or write short accounts of alleged encounters with the character, sculpting as they did some of the features recognized 
today. With each new detail in the new account, posters helped in building a mythos around the character that because of its viral scope and myriad of conflicting details and accounts, did not retain a canon version and this process happened fast. The day after Nutsen's post, a user named LeechCode5 posted a photo with a backstory featuring Slenderman. By June 14th, a user named Trench Mall had used Slenderman in his own story. A user known as Theria Up posted a story about a figure in Germany who stalked children on the edge of the forest, providing an invented historical reference point for the character. On June 20th of the same year, Slenderman became the subject of a YouTube video series based upon an earlier Something Awful post by user Troy Wagner. The series, which alleged to detail interactions or discoveries about the Slenderman, was made while working on a film project named Marble Hornets. The series of videos was supported by a Twitter feed, and a second YouTube channel allowed the character to move from being just a text, with the character now being referred to, discussed, and modified across a number of different platforms and modalities by an ever-growing number of contributors. So the specific Slenderman video that I read, I think it's a great introduction, but I think it's a lame like story. I tried to go back to the first Slenderman story. I think that was it. I'm pretty sure that one was it. I know there are better ones because people, anyone can make a story, but I think this was the first Slenderman story and it was a lame story, but it was a really good introduction. So if you want a better Slenderman story, it's not actually about Slenderman, but he's a big topic in it. We're going to head on over to Tiki Toby. Tiki Toby. I, I can't wait to talk about that after you're done listening. I got Tiki Toby recommended by a Discord user because they're in the Patreon chat. So, if, you know, if you become a patron, you can talk to me directly. I asked them like a month and a half ago, like, what specifically do you guys want as patrons? I will put it in the video. So they let me know. And someone said Tiki Toby. And I'm so happy I took what they said because this one is a really great story. So I'll see you guys after Tiki Toby. Tiki Toby, written by Castaway. The long road home seemed to go on and on. The road continued to stretch in front of the vehicles endlessly. The light that shone through the branches of the tall, green trees danced across the windows in random patterns, and every once in a while, obnoxiously shining in your eyes. The surroundings were full of deep green trees forming a forest around the road. The only sound was that of a car's engine as it traveled down the path. It was peaceful and left a serene feeling. Although the ride seemed like a nice one, it lacked every form of nice from its two passengers. The middle-aged woman behind the steering wheel had neat short brown hair that fit her complexion quite well. She wore a green v-neck t-shirt and a pair of blue jeans. Diamond stud earrings decorated each of her ears, which partially showed from behind her haircut. She had deep green eyes, which her shirt brought out, and the lighting seemed to make them more noticeable. There wasn't anything significant about her appearance. She looked like any other average mother, those that you would see on TV shows. However, the one thing that made her different from the average mothers was the dark bag she had under her eyes. Her facial expression was gloomy and sad. Although she genuinely looked like someone who smiled a lot, she would sniffle every once in a while and occasionally glance in the rear view mirror to look at her son in the backseat, who was hunched over partially, with his arms held tight around his chest, and his head pressed against the cold window. The boy lacked any normal appearance, and anyone could plainly see there was something wrong with him. His messy brown hair went every which way, and the luminous lighting brought out his pale, almost gray skin. His eyes were dark, unlike his mother's, and he wore a white t-shirt and scrub pants that had been provided for him by the hospital. The clothes he had worn before were so shredded and blood-stained that they weren't wearable anymore. The right side of his face bared a few cuts with a split eyebrow. His right arm was bandaged all the way to his shoulder, which had been shredded when his right side hit the shattered glass. His injuries appeared to be painful, when in reality, he couldn't feel anything. This was just one of the glories of being him. One of the challenges he had to face while growing up was growing up with a rare disease that had caused him to be completely numb towards pain. Never before had he felt himself get hurt. He could have lost an arm and felt nothing. The other major disorder he had faced, which was the one that deemed him many insulting nicknames in the short time he had attended grade school before he'd switched to homeschooling, was his Tourette syndrome, which caused him to tick and twist in ways he couldn't control. He would crack his neck uncontrollably and twitch every once in a while. The kids would tease him by calling him Tiki Toby, and they mocked him with exaggerated twitching and laughing. It got so bad that he had to turn to homeschooling. It was too hard for him to be in a common learning environment with seemingly every kid poking, or more like stabbing, fun at him. Toby stared blankly out the window, his face empty of any emotion, and every few minutes his shoulder, arm, or foot would twitch. Every bump that the car tires hit would make his stomach turn. Toby Rogers was the boy's name, and the last time Toby remembered riding in a car was when it crashed. That's all he thought about, unconsciously replaying everything he remembered before he blacked out over and over again. Toby had been the lucky one. His sister hadn't been so lucky. When the thought of his sister came, he couldn't help the tears that welled up in his eyes. The horrible memories replayed in his mind. Her screaming that had cut off when the front of the car was smashed in. It all went blank for a moment before Toby opened his eyes to see his sister's body, her forehead pierced with glass shards 
her hips and legs crushed under the force of a steering wheel, and her torso being pushed in from the too late inflated airbag. This was the last thing he had seen of his dear older sister. The road home continued on for what seemed like forever. It took so long to get home because his mom wanted to avoid the sight of the crash. When the surroundings gave way to a familiar neighborhood, they were both more than ready to get out of the car and step back into their own home. It was an older neighborhood, with quaint little houses all next to each other. The car drove in front of a blue house with white window panes. They both quickly noticed the old vehicle that was parked in front of the house, and the familiar figure that stood in the driveway. Toby felt automatic anger and frustration take over him at the sight of his father, his father who wasn't there. His mother pulled the car up in the driveway beside him before turning off the engine and preparing to step out and face her husband. Why is he here? Toby said quietly as he looked back at his mother who reached to open the car door. He's your father, Toby. He's here because he wants to see you. His mother responded in a monotone voice, trying to sound less shaky, yet couldn't drive up to the hospital to see Lyra before she died? Toby narrowed his eyes out the window. He was drunk that night, honey. He couldn't drive. Yeah, when is he not? Toby pushed the door open before his mother and stumbled out onto the driveway where he met his father's gaze before looking down at his feet with a stern expression. His mother stepped out behind him and met her husband's eyes before walking around her car. His father opened up his arms, expecting a hug from his wife, but she walked past him and put her arm around Toby's shoulder and started leading him inside. Connie? Her husband began in a raspy voice. What? No welcome hug? She ignored her husband's obnoxious words and walked past him with her son under her arm. Hey, he's 16. He can walk by himself. His father began to follow them in. He's 17. Connie glared back at him before opening the door to the house and stepping inside. Toby, why don't we get you in your room to rest, okay? I'll come get you when dinner is ready. No, I'm 16. I can walk by myself. Toby said sarcastically and glared back at his father before stumbling up the small staircase and turning into his room, where he slammed the door violently. His little room didn't have much in it. Just a small bed, a dresser, a window, and his walls had a few picture frames of his family back when they were a family. Before his father became an alcoholic and acted violently towards the rest of the family, Toby remembered when he was arguing with his mom and he grabbed her by the hair and shoved her to the floor. And when Lyra had tried to break it up, he pushed her and she hit her back on the corner of the kitchen counter. Toby could never forgive him for what he did to his mother and sister. Never. Toby didn't care about how much his father beat him down. He couldn't feel it anyway. What he did care about was how he intentionally hurt the only two people he cared about. And when he was waiting in the hospital where his sister took her last breaths, the only one who didn't rush there was his dad. Toby stood by the window and looked out at the street. He could have sworn he saw something out the corner of his eye, but quickly blamed it on the meds he was on. When dinner time had come and his mother called up to him, Toby came down the stairs and hesitantly sat down across the table from his father and in between his mother and an empty chair. It was quiet as his parents picked at their food, but Toby refused to eat. Instead, he just watched his dad with a blank stare. His mother caught onto his staring and elbowed him slightly. Toby looked over at her slightly and then down to his uneaten food, which he still didn't touch. Toby laid in bed. He pulled his covers over his head and stared out the window. He was tired, but there was no way he would fall asleep. He couldn't. There was too much to think about. He had been debating on whether or not to follow his mother's directions and forgive his father or continue holding a grudge with his boiling hatred. He heard his door creak open and his mother padded into the room and sat on the bed next to him. She reached over and rubbed his back, which had been turned to her. I know it's hard, Toby. Trust me. I understand, but I promise you'll get better, she said softly. When is he going to leave? Toby said with an innocent tone and a shaky voice. Connie let her gaze fall down to her feet. I don't know, honey. He's staying as far as I know, she replied. Toby didn't respond. He just continued to look forward at the wall, holding his damaged arm near his chest. After a few minutes of silence, his mother sighed before she leaned in to kiss his cheek and stood up to walk out of the room. Good night, she said as she closed the door. The hours passed slowly, and Toby couldn't quit tossing and turning. Every time he let his imagination take over, he heard the screeching of tires, the screaming of his sister, and he would uncontrollably jerk in bed. He threw off his cover, and lying on his back, he pulled his pillow over his face and cried into it. He could hear his own pitiful weeping. He would have been screaming and crying if he didn't press his pillow over his face. After a few seconds, he threw his pillow off his face, sat up, hunched over, held his head, and breathed roughly, tears streaming from his eyes. He couldn't help but cry. He tried to keep it in, but he couldn't stop the whining and whimpering as he sat there shaking. He inhaled before he stood up and walked around his bed to the window and peered out, taking deep breaths trying to calm down. He rubbed his eyes and looked out at the group of tall pine trees across the street. He stopped suddenly, and his gaze slowly centered on something standing under the street light. He heard a ringing in his ears and couldn't look away. The figure stood beside the street light, long arms draped at its sides as it stared up at him with non-existing eyes. The figure had no facial features to speak of, no eyes, no mouth, no nose, yet it held Toby's hypnotized stare, seemingly peering into his very being. The ringing in his ears grew louder and louder each second he stared before suddenly it all went to black. The next morning, Toby woke in his bed. He felt different. He wasn't tired at all, and when he consciously woke up, it felt like he had been lying there awake for hours. He had no thoughts flowing through his mind. He sat up slowly and stumbled over to the wall, but when he stood there, he automatically felt dizzy. He stumbled through the doorway and walked down the stairs. His parents
parents were sitting at the table. His father was tuned into the small TV that sat on the countertop, and his mother was reading the newspaper. She quickly looked over when she felt Toby's presence looming behind her. Well, good morning, sleepyhead. You've been sleeping forever. She greeted him with a hesitant smile. Toby looked over at the clock, and he noticed it was 12.30 p.m. I made you breakfast, but it got cold. I was gonna wake you up, but I felt you needed sleep. Her expression fell from happy to worried as her son resisted responding to her. Are you alright? Toby stumbled over and sat by his father. He felt as if he was on idle and had no control over his actions. He was seeing everything he did, but it didn't register in his brain properly. He reached out to his father's arm, but his hand ended up getting slapped. His father turned to him abruptly and pushed his chair over his foot. Don't touch me, boy! He yelled. His mother stood up. Alright, knock that off. This is the last thing we need. The days went by and things continued on as they were. Connie spent most of her time cleaning the house and her rude husband spent most of his time ordering her around. It was just like how it used to be before the crash. Toby never really left his room. He would sit by his bed and tremble. His mind would wander, but his thoughts changed too fast to be remembered. He would pace around his small room like a caged animal or stare out the window. The unhealthy cycle continued. Connie continued to be pushed by her husband, being way too submissive to him, and Toby remained in his room. Before he could think twice, he would begin to chew on his hands, tearing the flesh from his fingers. He would gnaw on his hands until they bled. When his mother walked in on him doing so, she reacted horribly. She rushed him downstairs and grabbed the first aid kit, wrapping his hands in bandages. Afterward, she demanded that he wouldn't leave her side again. Toby isolated himself so much that he grew to hate being around others. His memory grew glitchy as well. He'd start missing memory of minutes, hours, days, and so on. He would begin talking nonsense about things completely unrelated to the conversations he would have. He'd go off about seeing things, sharks in the sink as he washed the dishes, hearing crickets in his pillows, and seeing ghosts outside of his bedroom window. His mother grew so anxious about his mental health that she decided it would be good for him to talk to a professional about what he was feeling. Connie walked Toby into the building, holding his hand and guiding him in. She walked him up to the front desk and began talking to the lady who sat behind it. Mrs. Rogers? The lady asked. Yes, that's me. Connie nodded. We're here to see Dr. Oliver. I'm here with Toby Rogers. Yes, right this way. The lady stood and led them down a long hallway. Toby looked at the framed artwork down the halls and tuned into the sound of the lady's high heels on the hardwood floor. She opened the door to a room with a table and two chairs. If we can get him to sit in here for a few minutes, I'll get the doctor. She smiled and held the door open. Toby stumbled into the room and sat down at the table. He looked over at his mother and the lady before the door slowly shut behind them. He looked around the room before he held up his tightly bandaged hands and began to bite at the bandages to unwrap his hands. But he was interrupted as the door swung open and a young woman in a black and spotted dress with light blonde hair stepped in, holding a clipboard and a pen. Toby? She asked with a smile. Toby looked up at her and nodded. Nice to meet you, Toby. My name is Dr. Oliver. She put her hand out for him to shake, but hesitantly pulled away when she noticed his bandaged hands. Oh, she smiled nervously before clearing her throat and sitting in a chair across the table from him. So, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Try to answer them as honestly as possible, okay? She placed her clipboard down on the table. Toby nodded slowly and held his restrained hands on his lap. How old are you, Toby? 17, he responded quietly. She wrote that down on the paper that was clipped to the clipboard. What's your full name? Toby Aaron Rogers. When's your birthday? April 28th. Who is your immediate family? Toby paused for a minute before answering her question. My mom, my dad, and he stopped. M my sister. I heard about your sister, dear. I'm really sorry. Her expression faded into a sad, pity-filled look. Toby nodded. Do you remember anything from the crash, Toby? Toby looked away from her. His mind went blank for a moment. He looked down at his lap and, in the surrounding area, he heard a faint ringing sound. His eyes widened and he froze in place. Toby? The counselor asked. Toby, are you listening? Toby felt a shiver go down his spine until he froze again and slowly looked over out the little window through the door where he saw it. A dark, featureless figure peering in at him. He stared eyes widened. The ringing grew louder and louder until suddenly the loud voice of the counselor broke his trance. Toby! She yelled. Toby jumped and fell sideways out of his chair and backed up into the corner. Dr. Oliver stood up, holding her clipboard to her chest, a surprised look in her eyes. Toby met her eyes again his breath hitching as he twitched. That night, Toby lay in bed. His eyes were dazed as he stared straight up at his ceiling. He could feel himself begin to doze off when he heard the scattering of footsteps down his hallway. He sat up and looked towards the doorway, his door wide open. There was no light. Everything was lit by the luminescent blue glow of the moon through his window, leaving a cold lighting. He stood up and slowly made his way toward the doorway when suddenly the door, which previously was wide open, slammed in his face. He gasped and fell back. He was out of breath when he hit the ground and began breathing heavily, his eyes wide open. He waited for a few seconds before getting back on his feet. He reached out and grasped the cold door handle with his bandaged hand and creaked it open. He looked out into the dark hallway and tiptoed out of his room. The window at the end of the hallway lit up the darkness with the blue moonlight as he padded his way down. He could hear footsteps rustling around him and faint giggling followed by the pitter-patter of small feet, which sounded like a child had run in front of him, giggling and running around. The hallway was a lot longer than he remembered. It seemed endless, like the ride home from the hospital. He heard the door creak in front of him. Mom? He called in a shaky voice. Suddenly, a door slammed behind him. He 
he jumped and turned around. Behind him, he heard a long, eerie groan that sounded like a crow right in his ear. He turned around as fast as he could and was suddenly face to face with none other than his dead sister. Her eyes were clouded white, her skin pale, the right side of her jaw dangling there by tissue and muscle, glass protruding from her forehead, black blood leaking down her face, blonde hair pulled up in a ponytail as it always was, and she was wearing her gray t-shirt and athlete shorts, which were dirty and spotted with blood. Her legs were bent in ways they couldn't be. She stood there, emitting a long croaking noise only an inch away from Toby's face. Toby yelped and fell back. He started to crawl backward from her, but he was unable to break the eye contact he held with her blank, dead eyes. He dragged himself backward until he backed up into something. He stopped for a second. Everything was dead silent except for his heavy breathing and crying. He slowly looked up to meet the blank face of a tall, dark figure. The same figure that stood over him, though. Behind the tall, dark mass were rows of children looking to range from 3 to 10 years old. Their eyes completely black and dark with black blood leaked from their eye sockets. He screamed and stood up as fast as he could only to be tripped by dark black tendrils that wrapped around his ankle. He fell straight on his stomach and got the wind knocked out of him. He tried to scream but he couldn't make a sound. He wheezed out before it all went black. Toby woke with a start. He screamed out and sat up as fast as he could, completely short of breath. He wheezed out and held his chest with his bandaged hands. It was just a dream. He lay back down on his bed and rolled over on his side. It felt like weight had been lifted off his chest as he took in deep breaths. He stood up and padded over to his window. He saw nothing. Nobody was out there. No ghosts, no figures, nothing. He heard the rustling and coughing of his father outside the doorway. His door was closed. He walked over and opened it, looking out into the hallway once again, padded down the hallway and into the kitchen where he found his dad standing and having a smoke in the living room. Toby waited for a second and watched him from around the corner before a burning feeling started deep in his chest. Deep, boiling anger overtook him. He heard the little imaginary voices in his head. Do it. Do it do it, they chanted. He turned away and held his arms. He felt like he actually had control over himself, unlike he did for the past few weeks since he got home from the hospital. He actually had complete thoughts for just moments before the chanting of the little voices in his head clouded them. Kill him. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. Kill him kill him. They continued on. Toby trembled. No, no, he wasn't gonna do it. W was he going crazy? No, he won't kill anyone. He can't. He hated his father, but there was no way he was gonna kill him. That was it. The last thought he had before he fell into an idle state once again. The influence of the voices in his head was too much. He began to slightly walk up behind his father. He reached over the counter to the knife in the case. He gripped it in his hand. He felt the sensation take over his chest. He let out a snicker. He began laughing so hard he had to grasp for breath. His father turned around abruptly before he felt a brute force or shove him down the floor. He grunted as the air was knocked out of him. What? He looked up at the boy who stood over him, grasping the kitchen knife in his hand. Toby! What are you doing? He went to sit up and put his arms out in front of him in self-defense, but before he knew it, Toby was on top of him. He went to grab his neck, but his father reached out and blocked his hand by grabbing onto his wrist. Stop! Get off me, you little fucker! He yelled and with his other hand threw off-center punches towards Toby's shoulder, but he didn't stop. The look in Toby's eyes was not sane. It looked as if a demon had taken over him. He yelled back and went to stab the knife into his father's chest, but his father blocked him and grabbed onto his wrist once again. He went to shove him back, but Toby kicked his feet out in front of him and landed a hard blow straight into his father's face. His father recoiled and put his arms away to cuff his face, but Toby got back up and drove the knife straight into his shoulder. His father let out a loud cry and went to pull the knife out, but before he could, Toby threw his fist straight into his face. He began to pound his fist into his head, laughing and wheezing. He cracked his neck and grabbed the knife and ripped it out of his father's shoulder. He drove it deep into his dad's chest and repeatedly stabbed into his torso, blood spilling out and getting splattered everywhere. He didn't stop until his father's body went still. He threw the knife over to the side and leaned over his body, coughing and panting. He stared at his father father smashed in face and sat there twitching until a loud scream broke the silence. He looked over to see his mother standing a few feet away, covering her mouth with tears streaming down her face. Toby! She screamed. Why did you do that? She cried. Why? Toby stood up and began to back away from his father's bloody corpse. He began to back out of the kitchen. He looked down at the blood-soaked bandages on his hands and looked up at his mother one last time before he turned and ran out the house. He ran into the garage and slammed his hand against the control panel on the wall, pushed the button to open the garage door. Before he ran out, he noticed his father's hatchets, which had been hanging on the tool rack above a table full of jars filled to the brim with old rusted nails and screws. One of the hatchets was new. It had a bright orange handle and a shiny blade, and the other was old with a wooden handle and an old dull blade. He grabbed both and looked down at the table and he saw a box of matches, and under the table was a red gasoline tank. He held both of the hatchets in one hand and grabbed two matches and gasoline before running out of the garage, down the driveway, and up the street. As he approached the streetlight that he could see out his own bedroom window, he heard police sirens in the distance. He turned around and 
the red and blue flashing lights came rushing down the street. Toby stood for a second before he pulled open the cap on the gasoline tank and ran down the street, spilling gasoline all over the street after him. He turned and ran into the trees. He poured the last bit of gasoline out before he reached into his pocket and grabbed the match. He struck it against the box and immediately dropped it. In an instant, flames burst around him. The fire caught on the trees and bushes around him and before he knew it, he was surrounded by fire. The silhouettes of police cars were visible through the flames as he backed away into the forest around him. He looked around but his vision was blurred. His heart was pounding and he closed his eyes for a moment. This was it. This was the end. Toby felt a hand on his shoulder. He opened his eyes and looked over to see a large white hand with long bony fingers resting on his shoulder. He followed the arm that was attached to the hand up to a dark towering figure. It appeared to be wearing a dark black suit and its face was completely blank. It towered over Toby's small frame as it looked down on him. Tendrils reached from out its back. Before Toby knew it, his vision blurred and he heard the sound of ringing in his ears. Everything went blank. That was it. That was the end. That was how Toby Rogers died. A few weeks later, Connie sat in her sister's kitchen. Her sister Lori sat next to her drinking a cup of coffee. About three weeks ago, Connie lost her husband and her son, and a few weeks before, she had lost her daughter to a car crash. Since then, she moved in with her sister. The police were keeping her busy. They had just finished cleaning up the case, and the story had been released two weeks ago. The focus of the world seemed to have shifted to completely new stories. Lori switched the TV on to a news broadcast. On the TV, the news reporter began introducing a new headline. We have breaking news. Last night, there had been reported the murder of four individuals. There are no suspects yet, but the Victims were a group of middle school kids who had been out in the woods late last night. The kids have been bludgeoned and stabbed to death. The investigators have discovered a weapon at the crime scene. It appears to be an old, dull blade hatchet as you can see here. The picture changed to show snapshots of the weapon exactly as it was left at the crime scene. Investigators have pulled the name of a possible suspect, Toby Rogers, a 17 year old boy who stabbed his father to death a few weeks ago and tried to cover up his escape by setting a fire in the streets and forest area around the neighborhood. Although they believe the young boy had died in the fire, investigators suspect Rogers might still be alive due to the fact that his body was never found. Yeah, so that was Tiki Toby. I can definitely see why this is a fan favorite. And while I was doing research, the person that wrote this Castaway, I'm pretty sure they did the same art, unless it's another person named Castaway, which I don't think so. I think that's crazy. I think that's so talented. Like whoever, like Castaway, you are so talented for drawing it and also writing the story. Amazing job amazing job this one was the a longer one in the video uh, the longest in case you were wondering was sonic.exe that that was about like 21 minutes this one is 19 minutes this tiki toby story was better than the last slender man creepypasta that i read this one is just so detailed and so descriptive it's, it's such a good story but yeah let's head on over to our final creepypasta of this video laughing jack laughing jack written by snuff bomb it was a nice summer day. My five-year-old son, James, was playing outside in the backyard of our suburban home. James has always been a quiet boy. He plays by himself mostly. He never had many friends, but he has always had a wild imagination. I was in the kitchen feeding our dog Fido when I heard what sounded like James talking to someone in the backyard. I'm not sure what it was he could be talking to. Could he have finally made a friend? Being a single mom, it's hard for me to always keep an eye on my son, so I decided to go outside and check on him. When I went to the backyard, I was a bit confused because James was the only person back there. Was he talking to himself? I could have sworn I heard another voice. James, it's time to come inside. I called out to him. He came inside and sat down at the kitchen table. It was about lunchtime, so I decided to make him a turkey sandwich. James, who were you talking to out there? I asked. James looked up for a moment. I was playing with my new friend, he said, smiling. I poured him some milk and continued to pry as any good mother would. Does your friend have a name? Why didn't you ask him to have lunch with us? I asked. James stared at me for a moment before replying. His name is Laughing Jack. I was a bit taken back by what he had said. Oh, that's a strange name. What does your friend look like? I asked, a bit confused. He's a clown. He has long hair and a big swirly cone nose. He's got long arms and baggy pants with stripy socks and he always smiles. I realized my son was talking about an imaginary friend. I suppose it's normal for kids his age to have imaginary friends, especially when he has no real kids to play with. It's probably just a phase. The rest of the day went by as per usual, and it was starting to get late, so I put James to bed. I tucked him in, gave him a kiss, and made sure to turn on his nightlight before I closed the door. I was pretty tired myself, so I decided to go to bed not long after. I had an awful nightmare. It was dark. I was in some kind of rundown amusement park. I was scared running through an endless field of empty tents, broken down rides, and abandoned game hunts. The whole place had a horrible look to it. Everything was black and white. The prized stuffed animals all hung from nooses in the game huts, all with sick grins stitched on their faces. It felt like the whole park was looking at me, even though there wasn't another living thing in sight. And suddenly, I began to hear music play. The sounds of Pop Goes the Weasel being played on a squeeze box echoed through the park. It was hypnotizing. I followed its tune to the circus tent, almost in a trance, unable to stop my legs from moving forward. It was pitch black. The only light came from a single spotlight shining on 
on the center of a big top. As I walked toward the light, the music slowed down. I found myself singing along, unable to stop. All around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel. The monkey, though, twas all in fun. The music stopped right before its climax, and suddenly the light shot on. The intensity of the lights was practically blinding. All I could see was a small dark silhouette shuffle towards me. Then another one appeared, and another, and another. There were dozens of them, all coming toward me. I couldn't move. My legs were frozen. All I could do was watch as these haunting figures drew near. As they got closer, I could see they were children. As I looked at each one, I noticed they were all horribly disfigured and mutilated. Some had cuts all over their body, others were severely burnt, and others were missing limbs, even eyes. The children enveloped me, lying in my flesh, dragging me to the ground, and tearing inside me. As the children tore me apart and I faded away, all I could hear was laughter. Horrible, awful, evil laughter. I woke up the next morning in a cold sweat. After taking a few deep breaths, I looked over and saw that a few of James's action figures were positioned facing me on the top of my nightstand. I sighed. James had probably woken up early and put these here. I gathered up the toys and made my way to James's room. However, when I opened the door, James was sound asleep. I just shrugged and placed the toys back in his toy box and headed out to the living room. A little while later, James woke up and I made him breakfast. He was quiet and seemed a bit groggy. Perhaps he didn't sleep too well either. I decided to ask him about the toys. James, honey, did you put the toys in mommy's room this morning? His eyes shot up at me for a moment then quickly glanced down to his cereal. Laughing Jack did it. I rolled my eyes and responded, well, you tell Laughing Jack to keep the toys in your room. James nodded and finished up his breakfast, then decided to go play out in the backyard. I went to relax in the living room and I must have dozed off because I woke up a couple hours later. Shit, I need to check on James. I was a bit worried. It had been about two hours and I haven't checked on him. I stepped out into the backyard, but James wasn't there anymore. I was getting nervous, so I called out to him. James! James, where are you? Just then, I heard a giggle come from the front yard. I rushed through the gate around to the front of the house. James was sitting on the sidewalk. I breathed a sigh of relief and walked over to him. James, how many times have I told you to stay in the backyard? James? What are you eating? James looked up at me, then reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of candies in all colors. This made me very nervous. James, who gave you that candy? James just stared at me, not speaking. James! Please tell mommy where you got that candy. James hung his head down and said, Laughing Jack gave it to me. My heart sunk. I kneeled down to look him in the eye. James, I've had enough of this damn Laughing Jack thing. He is not real. Now this is a very serious situation and I need to know who gave you the candy. I could see my son's eyes tear up. But mama, Laughing Jack did give me the candy. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. James has never lied to me, but what he's telling me is impossible. I made him spit out the candy and I threw the rest away. James appeared to be fine. Maybe I'm just overreacting. After all, he could have gotten it from Tom and Linda from next door or Mr. Walker down the street. Either way, I'm gonna have to keep a close eye on James. That night, I put James to bed as usual and decided to go to bed early myself. Suddenly, I was woken up by a loud bang coming from the kitchen. I sprang out of bed and hurried down the stairs. When I got to the kitchen, I was horrified. Everything on the counters had been thrown on the floor, and our dog Fido hung dead from the light fixture. His stomach was cut open and stuffed with candy, the same type that James was eating earlier that day. My shock was quickly broken by a sharp scream coming from James's room, followed by loud crashes. I quickly grabbed the knife from the drawer and moved up the stairs with the speed that only a mother whose child is in danger could have. I burst through the door and flicked on the lights. Everything in the room was knocked over and tossed on the floor. My poor son in his bed crying and shaking with fear. A pool of urine staining the sheets. I scooped my child up and ran out of the house and went next door to Tom and Linda's house. Luckily, they were still awake. They let me use their phone and I called the police. It didn't take them long to arrive and I explained what had happened. They looked at me as if I was crazy. They searched the house, but all they found was a dead dog and two trashed rooms. The officer told me that someone had probably gotten into the house and done this right before making a quick escape. I knew it wasn't true. All the doors were locked and none of the windows were open. Whatever was in my house didn't come from outside. The next day, James stayed inside. I didn't want him to leave my sight. I went into the garage and found his old baby monitor and set it up in his room just in case if anything happens tonight, I was going to be able to hear it. I went to the kitchen and grabbed the largest knife from the drawer and put it on my nightstand. Imaginary friend or not, I'm not letting anything hurt my little boy. Soon enough, night came. I put James to bed. He was afraid, but I promised him I wasn't going to let anything happen to him. I tucked him in, gave him a kiss, turned on the nightlight. Before closing the door, I whispered to him, good night, James. I love you. I tried to stay up as long as I could, but after a few hours, Hours, I felt myself drifting off. My baby would be safe for the night and I needed to sleep. Just as I laid my head on the pillow, I heard a soft noise come from the baby monitor I had put on my nightstand. At first, it sounded like interference, like the kind that a radio would make. Then it turned into a soft moan. Was James asleep? Then I heard it, the laugh from my nightmare, that horrible laugh. I sprung up from the bed and grabbed the knife from under my pillow. I rushed over to James's room and creaked the door open. I tried the light switch, but it wouldn't come on. I took a step in and I could feel a warm, thick liquid on my feet. Suddenly, James's nightlight came on and I could see the absolute 
horror laid out in front of me. James's body was nailed up on the wall, the nails piercing through his hands and feet. His chest was cut wide open and his organs hung down to the floor. His eyes and tongue had been removed, along with most of his teeth. I was disgusted. I could hardly believe this was my baby boy. Then I heard it again, the soft, desperate moan. James was still alive. My baby. My poor baby. In so much pain, barely clinging to life. I ran across the room and vomited on the floor, but my sickness was interrupted by a horrible cackle coming from behind me. I spun around while still wiping bile from my mouth. Then out of the shadows emerged the fiend responsible for all this horror, Laughing Jack. His ghost white skin and matted black hair hung down to his shoulders. He had piercing white eyes surrounded by dark black rings. His twisted smile revealed a row of sharp, jagged teeth, and his skin didn't look like skin at all. It almost looked like rubber or plastic. He wore a patchy, black and white clown outfit with striped sleeves and socks. His body itself was grotesque, and the way he was poised made him look almost boneless like a ragdoll. He let out a sickening laugh as if to let me know he was pleased with my reaction to his work. He then turned around slowly in front of James and began to laugh even more at the horrific sight he has laid out. That was enough to shake me from my terror. I snapped. Get away from him, you bastard! I rushed at the monster, raising the knife above my head and stabbed down at him. But as soon as the knife touched him, he disappeared in a cloud of black smoke. The knife passed right through and pierced James's still beating heart, splashing the warm blood on my face. No, what have I done? My baby. I, I killed my baby. I immediately fell to my knees and I could hear sirens in the distance growing louder. My boy. My sweet baby boy. I promised mommy would protect you, but I failed. I'm sorry, James. I'm so sorry. Police soon arrived to find me in front of my son, still wielding the knife covered in my baby's blood. The trial was short. Insanity. I was placed in a house for the criminally insane, where I've been now for the past two months. It's not so bad here. The only reason I'm awake now is because someone is playing Pop Goes the Weasel outside my window. I'll talk to the orderlies about it in the morning. So that was Laughing Jack. Personally, I would say it's a pretty normal, like not normal, but it's like I would give it like a 5 out of 10. Again, I'm not rating them. This is like the only rating I'm giving them or giving one of them. And I would give it a 5 out of 10 just because it's like... It's a little too, like, unnecessarily gruesome to, like, innocent people in the story. Like, the dog and the child. It's like, bro, <laughs> that's wild. I think the character concept is fire. I think it might be one of the most fire creepypasta characters of all time. If you made it this far, without skipping, you're actually the goat. You're actually really cool. This video took a long, long time. I think it was a month to make this video, so... Hopefully you leave a like. I want to give a big thank you to Andrew. That's one of my hometown friends. He actually cut the video up. I edited it on top of it, but he helped me so much with this process. So shout out to you, Andrew. Here's his Instagram. You could go check out his videos. And yeah, like I said in the beginning, if I missed any credit in the description below, please let me know. I want to give everyone as much credit as you deserve. If you wrote these stories and I didn't credit, or if I use your art and I didn't credit, use a song and didn't credit, let me know. I have a document description listing everything and everyone so if you're not on there then please let me know and before i go boom look at that that was that <laughs> i just got to show you guys one more time i was on a five week upload streak and i let you guys down i know but uh you guys really liked the last video i know you guys like real life morbid videos so we're gonna do those with sponsors and that one was on trending tab so thank you guys so much we were on trending again we haven't done that in a while that's really it as a reminder stop loving me deluxe is out with on cds and cassettes and you can order them now they're all going to be shipped and signed by me that's it for this video see you guys next time i upload